It's 9 a.m. live from the NASDAQ market site in New York City. I'm Shauna Smith alongside Brad Smith, and this is Yahoo Finance Live. Here's your morning rundown. One of the big stories of the day, Fed Chair Jay Powell set to speak this morning after comments from the central bank's most hawkish, more hawkish members. The market looking for guidance on the path forward. Rates were a big theme at Yahoo Finance Invest yesterday. AT&T CEO John Stanky weighing in on the policy moves thus far. I think I understand what the Fed has done. I wouldn't advocate for anything else what they've done because inflation is far more insidious than dealing with the results of, of high rates right now. And Disney reporting after the bell today, investors eager for insight into CEO Bob Iger's turnaround efforts, namely what the future has in store for ESPN. Former Disney exec Kevin Mayer weighed in on potential next steps yesterday. ESPN is his first priority, and he has uh, ideas to fix that and to, and to strengthen it and to change his business model over time. If that transition can be helped by parties that could be partners in a substantial way, that's what he's looking to do. And Republican presidential hopefuls head to the stage tonight for the third time, with 2024 shaping up to be a Trump-Biden rematch. Former CNN President Jeff Zucker calling this a, quote, critical time for America. And is it ruling out a second term for former President Trump? I think that the reason that a lot of people woke up in 2016 and were surprised that Donald Trump had won is because they never really uh, took that seriously. And, and I think that anyone who doesn't think that, that that's a, a distinct possibility here in 24 uh, is fooling themselves. And so higher for longer is still the debate of the day, and we'll get more commentary around it in the next few hours. Of course, we're going to be watching for Fed Chair Jay Powell due to address a conference in Washington, D.C. This morning, he'll be followed by New York Fed President John Williams. And yesterday, we heard from some of the central bank's more hawkish members, notably Dallas Fed President Lori Logan. She said, quote, we've seen some welcome progress with respect to inflation, but it still remains too high. Well, the rates conversation was certainly a hot topic at Yahoo Finance's Invest Conference yesterday. Newsmakers from at and CEO John Stanky and Dr. Doom Noriel Rubini had a lot to say on central bank policy. All right, so we're going to break all of that down here. In terms of what we heard yesterday, Brad, I think one of my big takeaways is there's still a lot of uncertainty, a lot of unknown, obviously, about what the Fed is going to do next. Clearly, we heard uh, many opinions about maybe what the Fed should or should not do. Noriel Verbini was one of those who's weighing in just in terms of whether or not a soft landing is possible at this point. Jeffrey Gunlock saying that he personally thinks the Fed is done, and that's something that the bond market is clearly signaling. But there's still lots of questions just about exactly where we go from here. Yeah, and I think for all of our viewers that were tuned into not just an amazing day yesterday, but especially some of the more kind of market-moving conversations that have taken place both leading up to and during Invest, one of them, Jeffrey Gunlock, did stick out to me as well for the very matter that you just brought up a moment ago and where we're getting expectations for rates to actually either for the Fed to actually be done for right now or on the other side where they might expect a cut to begin and that's where some of the calculus really drives the conversation now is if we are seeing the Fed recognize where there is some more data that's starting to turn over and starting to point out all right we're going to get towards that two percent target we're still well off of that and that was acknowledged yesterday in a few conversations as well so i think within that the the gun lock commentary and especially where the bond market tends to move on his commentary uh that was noteworthy i think for a lot of our viewers to tune into yeah it certainly was and one, one of my discussions yesterday was with scott sperling he's a co-ceo of thl and i was asking him just about what he sees as a path forward for the economy, whether or not a soft landing is possible at this point, and also what he thinks the Fed should do. Let's take a listen to what he had to say. I think we should be very careful that it's very, very difficult, given all the complexities and everything going on in the world, uh, to navigate to a so-called soft landing. So I would expect that it's going to be difficult. They're always difficult, no matter what the causal factors are. Um, hopefully relatively short-lived, and many of them have been more short-lived than, than not, uh, but it's going to be a difficult and choppier economy uh, going forward. 
So it's going to be a difficult and bumpier economy there. That was that was uh, Scott Sperling's words here. Just in terms of what that means for market strategy, for investment strategy, was another hot topic of the day yesterday. And Sperling saying that the next 15, 18 months, yes, it's going to be challenging, but he was optimistic just about the opportunity after, or in just about a year and a half from now. He mentioned the fact that he still sees opportunity within the AI space, obviously one of the areas that has clearly outperformed, at least in the first half of the year. And we have certainly started to see or continue to see some of the winners within that space. He also likes some names within the healthcare space. So certainly investors adjusting their playbook just a little bit and also looking ahead to what we could see for returns in 2024. 2024, back half of 2024. And and even as we get towards Q3, Q4, and for what we heard from from Double Lines, Jeffrey Gunlock yesterday, Q2 2024 is what he's looking at for a potential recession. It'll be interesting going into that, how investors not just adjust their portfolios, but also where business executives, some of the CEOs that we spoke to yesterday, where they're also factoring that into some of how they're navigating uh, the Fed environment right now. All right. Well, investors are closely watching more Fed speak today for any hints about the Fed's next move on rates and whether another hike is necessary. Verizon CEO Hans Vestberg told us yesterday at Yahoo Finance Invest the impact of higher rates, what they're doing to his business. Normally, you would think about with all these interest rates going up, we we would see a slowdown very quickly in the U.S., but we don't see it. And the reason is, of course, that not all that interest increase is going straight to consumers. It hits the ones that have variable interest rates, which corporations might have and uh, and things like that. So I see much more tougher in especially Europe. We want to bring in Ellen. He is in FL Putnam Investment Management Co-Chief Market Strategist. Ellen, great to see you here. So let's break down exactly what we're seeing. We talked to a number of business leaders yesterday. The impact that their business specifically is seeing because of higher rates. But then also we talked to a number of strategists, economists uh, yesterday, business leaders, just about what they see in terms of the forecast here going forward for Fed policy. I'm curious what you're seeing from a market perspective and how you're just adjusting your strategy as a result. Uh, Well, thanks for having me. First of all, the market is pricing in that the Fed is going to start cutting rates uh, mid next year. I think May is the current forecast. That may be too aggressive on the market's parts. As we're looking at this, the Fed has been pretty clear, uh, and especially with uh, more recent Fed speakers out in the last day or two, saying that they might be higher for longer. And as you know, that's going to have a dampening effect on equities. Equities have already had a really strong return this year, and I wouldn't be surprised to see equities be kind of uh, muddled through for the rest of the year as we move forward. Why is that? Um, Number one, although we're seeing an earnings rebound, Uh, with Q2 being the trough in earnings and Q3 being a little bit better, Q4 accelerating. We're also seeing GDP estimates clearly showing that the economy is going to slow next year. We saw a slower economy in in the labor numbers that came out last Friday. So as we look forward, given that the market is over 18 times earnings, it's hard to expect a lot of market return from here. I think instead we're going to see churn for the next several months. Where where does that churn begin at? Where, where is some of the, the, the slippage or the outflow, do you believe, kind of initiated? Well, one of the things that we're looking at, as well as a lot of other market participants, is the performance of those AI stocks, uh, and particularly the so-called Magnificent, Magnificent Seven. And as we look at those, they had outperformed massively through most of the first half of the year. But in September, October, They've underperformed the overall market. So even though they remain very strong on a year-to-date basis, you're seeing some of the air come out of that. A lot of those are very long-duration stocks. As rates have come up over the last several months, you have seen that reflected in the valuations compressing a little bit for those stocks. So we can see a turn away from some of those AI plays toward areas that have underperformed so far year-to-date, particularly some stable areas, steady, eddy, boring companies that have not participated as much as those AI stocks. So, Ellen, when we talk about some of the other areas of opportunity within the market here, outside of AI, outside of uh, some of the recent outperformance that we've seen, what are some of the names or some of the sectors that then you like at this point? Well, we're looking at very steady, high cash flow, high return on invested capital compounders. So what does that mean? Um, One example is a company like Paychex. They 
do payroll processing and other HR functions for small to medium sized businesses, very sensitive to payrolls. And as we have seen, jobs have remained very strong all year. That's a company with amazing return on invested capital, over over 40% return on invested capital. And you can get it for not too much more than 20 times earnings. So that's, that's a stock that we really like. We think it's gonna do well outside of any, uh, outside of a recession in almost any market environment that's gonna do well. Another really steady eddy company, kind of boring, but again, good return on invested capital, is Republic Services, a waste management company, duopoly business for the most part, very steady. You get at one or two points of volume, you get two to four points of price, grows through almost any market environment. And again, you can get that for just over 20 times earnings. And so some of these steady eddy companies have just continued to churn along in the background and are not subject to that same multiple compression that you see from the long duration assets. Is there, is there any kind of common denominator in what you're hearing from CEOs of the steady eddy companies as you've defined them that kind of gives you an inclination to, to be a little bit more either bullish about them or just what their prospects are in the industries that they operate? Well, for the most part, they're keeping an eye on the overall economy. And they're looking at rates, of course, but they're really focusing on the nuts and bolts of their business. So they want uh, jobs to continue strong, for sure. And they're looking at overall indicators, but they're not so focused on what the pundits are saying. Instead, they're looking at their overall business and how they can grow, how they can continue to um, provide both volume and pricing growth going forward. So I would say that they're focused on the nuts and bolts rather than looking at the overall economic picture. Alan, um, when it comes to the biggest driver of the markets from here going forward, obviously now that we're nearing the end of earnings season, is more of the focus now on earnings and the results that we've seen over the recent weeks versus the Fed, or how are you balancing those two critical factors? Well, we've seen almost all of the S&P uh, companies report to date. I think close to 90% have reported already. So for the most part, earnings are reported, they're done, they're in the bag, and there's not a lot more to look for except for those companies that have off-quarter earnings where their fiscal years or fiscal quarters end in October rather than in September. So we think the earnings for Q3 is, is behind us at this point. Not too many companies have given guidance for next year. So it's a bit of a quiet period. Of course, there are conferences and other public forums where companies are speaking as you had yesterday. So we'll see what they have to say there. But at this point, from a company perspective, most of the news is actually gonna be more relevant from the Fed and speakers um, that from the Fed that are talking, as you noted, this week and next week and going forward. Um, the other thing we're watching is economists' forecasts for GDP, and those are still going up for next year. So we're seeing a slowing economy, but the economists were, for the most part, too bearish earlier in the year. So they're yeah. playing catch-up. So we're watching that as well. Yeah, but, yeah, but Ellen, sorry if I worded that incorrectly, but I, I was talking about just in terms of now that we're moving on from third quarter earnings season, have we seen the shift in sentiment from investors or a little bit more reassured, a little bit more optimistic, given the results that we got this past earnings season? Well, surprises were decent. Uh, surprises were, I think, 1% on sales and 7 or 8% on revenue. So those were decent, but those are smaller than they have been historically. The other thing that's a little bit worrisome, and I think points to a little bit of market fatigue, which drives our, our churn narrative, is that the market has been rewarding beaters less and punishing missers more than it has historically. And so that's telling you that the market is saying, yep, great, thank you, not quite enough for what we're looking for because the market's a little bit expensive at the moment. Yeah, some data from FactSet coming into the start of this week. Uh, earnings growth for Q3 2023 blended year over year for the S&P 500, 3.7%, so uh, would mark the first quarter of year-over-year -year earnings growth reported by the index since Q3 2022. So some interesting tidbits there that they've been tracking on that earnings front. Ellen Hazen, who is the FL Putnam Investment Management Company Chief Market Strategist and Portfolio Manager. Thanks so much for joining us this morning to kick off the show, Ellen. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Absolutely. Well, the New York Times poll that came out on Monday showed Donald Trump leading President Biden in five key battleground states. Trump is taking a chunk of the younger voter base as well as black and Hispanic voters. 
This news is a major blow to Democrats hoping for an easy re-election for Biden. Former CNN president Jeff Zucker joined us live at Yahoo Finance Invest yesterday and said that there is a distinct possibility of another Trump win, but we shouldn't pay too much attention to polling like this. Let's take a listen. I think that the key uh, in preparing for that possibility, and, and I think you have to acknowledge it's a real possibility, is, um, is not to get caught up in the, uh, in the polls that came out yesterday. There's so much attention uh, attendant to that, uh, and I, I think that continues to be a huge mistake. If you went by the poll in 1983, uh, you would have thought that there's no way that Ronald Reagan could win re-election. Or the poll in 2011, there's no way that Barack Obama could have won re-election. So just how much stock should we put in these polls? Let's bring in Niall Standage, who is a White House columnist for The Hill. Niall, let, let's begin there. I mean, we point back to whether it be the midterm elections of 2022 or whether it even be the, the 2020 presidential elections and looked across a couple key battleground states Polling wasn't necessarily spot on there. And so that really cast a lot of question mark on the, the strength of the polling figures coming into the general election in 2024. Yeah, I do get that, Brad. And I get the reasons why there is public skepticism of polls. We have seen pollsters miss several times. I think what pollsters would tell you in their defense is that polls can be useful in either measuring patterns measuring trends or indicating public perception beyond just the question of whether they're going to vote for candidate X or candidate Y. So in that poll from the New York Times at the weekend, one of the most notable things about it was how many people are concerned about President Biden's age, more than 70 percent feeling that he couldn't serve a second term effectively, that he's too old to do so. We have seen that over several polls. It is plainly a major worry for voters. It's plainly not just something that Republicans use to, to beat the president with, and it's an issue for the White House. That does not mean, to take Jeff Zucker's point, that the exact result in Pennsylvania or Wisconsin or Michigan one year from now is going to be what those polls predict. It's kind of amazing here we're talking about age and Republicans using it so much when the age difference is just about three years between Trump and Biden. Now, I'm curious, if the election were to be held today, who do you think would win? Trump would win. I think, if Trump I think Trump was Trump, the nominee. If, if Trump was the nominee, I think he would beat President Biden right now because we have seen so many of these polls now, whether it be in key states or nationally, that give him a very slight edge. Now, it will be different a year from now. Uh, former President Trump, if he's the nominee, will be front and center. That draws some people in, but honestly puts a lot of people off. He is still quite deeply unpopular himself. But you look across the board at President Biden's numbers on the economy, on immigration, on inflation, on a whole range of topics, and none of them are good. The White House and his re-election team are trying to change that, trying to change public perception, especially around the economy. But right now, if it were a referendum on the president, he wouldn't be voted in for a second term, in my judgment. You know, it's interesting. In some of the elections that took place across a few states and at the state legislature level yesterday, there, there was some sweeping Democratic wins and, you know, a roundup of some of the headlines, whether it be from the Hill and talking about that, five takeaways from the winning election night for Democrats or, or Rolling Stone that said, you know, abortion, maybe stealing women's rights wasn't the best election plan. It, it seems like there is a referendum that also is coming for the GOP right now, too, with regard to some key issues that they've been very vocal about. And for a lot of voters that are getting out there, finally, th they're coming to the polls with these in mind. I think any time there's a commonality between Rolling Stone and the Hill, there's definitely something going on. And it is uh, for sure <laughs> that the, the abortion topic is really, really salient. And it's really fascinating the way the political pendulum swings sometimes, Brad, because when you think about this, the, the anti-abortion or pro-life or whatever term you want to use, that side fought for 49 years to get Roe versus Wade undone, to get it repealed. They finally succeeded in doing that. 
And they've been getting thrashed everywhere ever since in statewide ballot measures, including in conservative states. Ohio from yesterday is an increasingly conservative state. We've also seen similar results in places like Kentucky and Montana. So there's obviously an issue where the uh, denial of abortion or restrictive abortion bans are politically toxic, and they're toxic for the Republican Party. And it's a really uh, important element in Democrats' appeal, not just at the presidential level, but at these levels of, of state races that we saw yesterday. I mean, Andy Bashir, the governor in Kentucky, won a second term in an extremely conservative state. And one of the reasons was he was able to, to use the abortion issue to his advantage. Now, the Israel-Hamas war, it seems like Americans are split just on the response uh, from the U.S. so far. How do you see this affecting 2024? In terms of the politics of it, I think there's a danger for Democrats because they are more divided on that topic. Now, I, I feel like I don't want to necessarily skip straight to the politics without acknowledging there's just enormous human suffering mm -hmm. going on there, both amongst the Palestinians and, and the Israelis from the October 7th attack. Politically, there's a big split between a traditional Democrats who tend to be older and more centrist, who are much more reflexively pro-Israel, and younger, more left-wing Democrats who have much more sympathy in the broader struggle with the Palestinians. We see this split, obviously, between someone like Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib and President Biden. You know, the Congresswoman accused him of being complicit in genocide. <laughs> the, the political danger there, I think, is that those divisions could depress Democratic turnout potentially next year. If, if there's even a small segment of the Democratic Party that feels that president has been too pro-Israel to the extent of essentially giving uh, a, a carte blanche to Israel to kill enormous numbers of Palestinians. Obviously, that can be a problem for Democrats going into the 2024 election. Now, Stanage, we appreciate you uh, sharing your insight here with us this morning. White House a columnist at The Hill. Thanks, Niall. Thank you. We are fast approaching the opening bell on Wall Street just about eight minutes from now. Let's take a look at some of the moves that we're seeing in pre-market trading. Jared Blickery, what are you seeing? Yes, looks like the S&P and Dow are up about 15, 16 basis points. Uh, looking at the Wi-Fi Interactive here, the Nasdaq and the Russell have both climbed into positive territory. Just give you a brief look at the overnight price action. You can see the S&P 500 futures started out in the red. They're at midnight and have now just kind of trended up, drifted up ever so slowly into the green. And I'd want to back out, uh, just show a longer term view of the S&P 500. Now, this is over the last seven days. This is this huge rally that we've seen that was spearheaded last week. Uh, but here's that six month chart I was looking at. We hit break even. So over six months at one point, only uh, seven days ago, S&P 500 was, was break even over that time period. Now we have broken through just barely this resistance trend channel. If you take a look at the Nasdaq 100, it's even more decisive. And let me show you the New York uh, Stock Exchange Bang Index and over the last three years. And you can see this huge, huge cup in handle or cup in flag pattern that looks pretty bullish on the longer term time frames. Now, I did say a couple weeks ago at the end of October, we were looking at a buy signal on seasonality. That was through Ryan Dietrich over at Carson Research Group. Uh, but I did say at the time, a lot of people are looking to fade this bump after a couple of weeks. So I'll be on the lookout for any kind of weakness on the horizon here. Now, here's the S&P 500 sectors. We're looking at consumer discretionary. That's up 37 basis points this morning, was up 1.12%. Let me just show you what the sectors have done over the last seven days. I'm going to take the pre-market quote slot so we can see this a little bit easier. But the mega cap sectors, you look at tech. Tech is up 8.5%, followed by consumer discretionary that has Amazon. XLC is communication services that has Alphabet and Meta. All of those really outperforming. And this has been on the back of dropping interest rates. The 10 year, I'm going to show you the 10 year now real quick before I go, has dropped 50 basis points in just a couple of weeks. Here's a three month chart, it was at 5%, and then it just recently hit 4.5%. 4.5%. That is a huge, huge tailwind for stocks, and they've taken advantage of it. Jared, stay with us for the opening bell. You're down there on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. No doubt a lot of bells and whistles are going to be taking place, but we're going to be checking back in in just a few minutes here. Everyone, we've got all your markets action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Welcome back. Taking a look at some of our market movers this morning. Rivian raising its production forecast for the year, upping it by 2,000 vehicles. The electric vehicle maker also ending its exclusivity deal with Amazon, opening its fans for other delivery opportunities. Staying in the EV maker lane, Lucid is lowering its 2023 production guidance. The company expects to produce between 8,000 and 8,500 cars. That's this year down from about 10,000 was the previous target. This comes after the car maker misses its third quarter estimates. Lucid isn't the only EV maker struggling. Tesla and GM both reported slow EV spending in the last quarter. Okay, so a lot to unpack here, but really kind of rounding out the EV landscape. There was something else that Lucid also had announced in their most recent executive addition, bringing in uh, a chief operating officer. So perhaps this one of the first big announcements under that realm and under the new tenure that's set to begin as well uh, for Mark Winterhoff. But all this considered, you think about where Lucid, where Rivian and the early production figures that we've seen those thus far. I mean, I've seen a caravan of Rivians coming through New York once before as they're really trying to sell into some of the major cities, bring more adoption into their ecosystem, just as all of the EV players are. Um, and at the same time, all of them adopting the North American charging standard. We just saw that from uh, Lucid as well. I think that was announced this week um, to make sure that it's easier and that people have more comfortability when they do get an EV that they're going to have the ability to charge it wherever they go as well. Yeah, but I think this all points back to the fact about what's going on right now within the EV space. It is very interesting to see what Rivian is doing in terms of upping their guidance, comparing that to what we heard from Lucid this week. Also, like you pointed out, what we've heard from GM, Ford, even Tesla lowering their prices once again to help boost demand. But I think that all just kind of goes back to the fact that EVs, at least from a mass market perspective, are not affordable. We talk about the fact that we need that lower priced EV. Clearly, it's probably not likely from a name like Rivian, given the current prices of their vehicles. But we talk about what's needed really to boost EV demand. Obviously, a massive shortfall when it comes to infrastructure. One of the other reasons or one of the other massive, I guess, barriers here in terms of that widespread adoption. But Rivian specifically, it's a stock that's been under tremendous amount of pressure over the last couple of months or last three months. I think the stock's off just about 30%. We've talked about a lot of the production issues that the company has had in the past. We know supply chain issues have been a huge problem here for the company. Also, just some production specific problems from their plant located in Illinois. So the fact that Rivian obviously raising its target, a bit of good news here. We're seeing that reaction play out in the stock today with gains of just about one and a half percent. But I think just overall going forward, when you talk about the opportunity, the growth opportunity for many of these companies, for many of the bigger players within this space. It all comes down to demand and what's necessary to boost that demand in the long run. Yeah, and the other major issue for a lot of these companies that are trying to sell new vehicles is going to be the used vehicle market. As more EVs get traded in, that's where, sure, a CarMax, a Carvana might be able to be a beneficiary, but at the same time, people are going to be looking for it at a lower price point, and that's when they get into that used car conversation versus purchasing brand new. Yeah, and of course, the higher rate environment, obviously another challenge here for many of these names. All right, Robinhood shares a slipping this morning after reporting a slowdown in trading activity for the third quarter. The company's transaction-based revenue falling 11% from a year ago and monthly active users that declined 16% on a year-over-year -year basis. Digging into these results here, transaction-based revenue, that was $185 million, well short of what the street was looking for. Monthly active users at $10.3 million. The estimate out there in the street was for $10.81 million. Certainly, uh, we're seeing some reaction from the street on the heels of these results. Piper Sandler saying that the fourth quarter guidance for net interest revenue, they called that disappointing. Clearly, a challenge here for the company moving forward. And then the team over at Mizuho, so really focusing on the average revenue per user, which did come in just below the street's expectations, around 80 bucks a share. Certainly, we're seeing this pressure Robinhood shares this morning. Yeah, a serious issue in the transaction-based revenue line item that you mentioned. With that down 11 yeah. percent year over year, 185 million is where that came in at. Options unchanged. Equities, though, that decreased 13 percent. Cryptocurrencies, that decreased 55 percent. When this company went public, all of the rage, all of the fanfare around them was what that growth strategy looked like, and it was really hinging on how many customers they could continue to attract and retain 
on the cryptocurrency offerings that they also were building out even more so. And so servicing that customer uh, was touted as one of the larger um, elements to their growth story. Vlad Tenev uh, giving a statement in this most recent quarterly earnings saying it's been 10 years since they founded Robinhood, saying they're just getting started, but a lot more products like Robinhood Gold, 4.9% annual yield on cash, 3% match on IRA. They're getting more into that retirement landscape as well. And so building out not just new modules for education and making sure people know how they're investing and um, you know the the depths of the trade that they might be making, but then additionally, looking at how they're retaining users. The monthly active users were down 16 percent year over year. So um, even as they're building out these different products and services, it still comes with that overall need to make sure that you're still building on top of that user base. And I think that's where, uh, especially according to these numbers, that's what's been the struggle point. Thus far. Yeah, and we'll see whether or not Robinhood's uh, efforts here to further diversify some of their revenue streams, that that maybe offsets some of the troubles that they're having, challenges that they're having when it comes to retaining their user base. All right, let's get to the opening bell on Wall Street. Do a quick check of some of the action that we're seeing all three of the major averages, at least here in the first couple of minutes of trading, starting off to the upside, Jared Blickery joining us again from the floor of the Stock Exchange. Jared, what are you seeing? Hey guys, uh, nice to see Sherman Williams painting the tape on the open this morning. That's the worst pun you're going to hear all morning, <laughs> by the way. I have on the Wi-Fi Interactive, the Dow is up over the last three days. Uh, 52 basis points, not a lot, but check out what the NASDAQ is doing. The NASDAQ has really been the outperformer over the last seven or now eight days, as I've been tracking, 1.4%. And the S&P 500 somewhere in the middle, 70, 69 basis points there. But let's get into some heat maps and just chart what has gone on uh, today so far and also this week. Here's tech. XLK is the number one performing uh, sector up about half a percent or 51 basis points, followed by real estate and industrials, a really interesting mix of outperformers there speaks to some of the value, the cyclical trade as well as growth, uh, as well as interest rate sensitivity. Uh, let me just show you uh, over the last three days, it's still been tech in the number one spot. XLK up 2.3%, followed by consumer discretionary and then healthcare. Uh, again, really an interesting mix. Haven't seen that uh, lately. Not going to read too much into it until we get farther into uh, the weekly close here. But here's the NASDAQ 100, how it's shaping up for the day. Apple up 75 basis points or three quarters of 1%. Amazon down just slightly about break even and Tesla down here. That's up about 32 basis points. Gilead I'm seeing as a standout uh, and bio, excuse me, Gilead down 5%. And we have another here, Biogen down about 5%. So a couple of healthcare names taking some hits. If I take a look at the leaders, uh, some of the ETFs that I like to track for sentiment in the market, uh, kind of an even split here. IPOs and cannabis in the forefront, up 2 and 1.3% respectively, followed by software. And then at the bottom, Korean stocks taking the biggest hit, down 2%, followed by solar and Bitcoin. Korean stocks, I have been tracking as a leading indicator for U.S. tech. Uh, they were leading on this most recent bounce, and uh, we'll have to see if we get some kind of downturn if they are in fact leading on that. But nevertheless, they are, it looks like uh, break even over the last six months or so. Uh, let's take a look inside the disruption field to see what some of the fringier parts of the market and are doing. And Roblox, a huge, huge standout. Uh, bookings way up. That's up 18%. Here's a year-to-date look, and you can see right back up, heading towards the upper end of its range for the year after dipping into the negative. So big win for Roblox investors today. And then also just checking in on the energy sector. We got some earnings last week there. And then it looks like today, another earnings story. Occidental, I believe up 2.36%. Guys. Yeah, been somewhat of a sideways year for XLE, but no doubt seeing some uh, positive movement uh, in a few spots there on the day, as you were mentioning, Occidental. Jared Blickery, thanks so much for continuing to track the worldview, the Roblox metaverse view, and all the, also the uh, commodities view. Rounded it out. <laughs> thanks, Jared. You bet. Busy guy. Yeah. All right, guys, let's uh, switch gears here. Talk a little Warner Brothers Discovery. Shares are taking a hit this morning on weaker streaming subscribers and some downbeat guidance for the coming year. The entertainment group saying the impact of strike action and a weak advertising market will linger into 2024. Uh, we're taking a look at the shares right now. They're down by about 15%. One of the things that jumped out to me within this was the acknowledgement of lower, uh, needing to lower the churn that they're seeing on Max here. They've announced a lot of new live program offerings, CNN 
Max, Bleacher Report add-on that they mentioned as well. Um, and, of course, yeah, Barbie, great quarter for that. But at the end of the day, it really does come back to these streaming figures and how that's going to impact more long-term the ability to make sure that that revenue and the global D2C subscribers um, are locked in over an extended period of time. Yeah, and it brings me back also to the discussion I was having yesterday with Jeff Zucker. And yeah. I asked him just how a company like CNN, obviously a property here of Warner Brothers, uh, how they balance that, right? When we talk about they're trying their best to maintain some of the lucrative deals that they have on the cable side, they also want to position themselves to be in a very strong strong position when it comes to streaming and what exactly that adoption looks like going forward. And he said to me that in the short run, yes, we're going to see some of the pressure on the bottom line. You need to spend. It's going to take some time. It's not something, obviously, that happens overnight. So we are going to see a bit of an impact here, at least in the short term, when it comes to that bottom line. But they have to figure out how to best balance this transition. It's going to be challenging. It's going to be difficult. And I think that's exactly what's reflected in these results here this morning. We take a look at some of those other numbers here. You mentioned the subscriber numbers, how they fell, obviously missing the streets expectations. But Barbie was a highlight there. We talk about the fact that the losses were wider than expected. They did narrow on a year over year basis. And a lot of that being attributed to the strength that we did see in Barbie here over the last couple months, one and a half billion dollars. You know I wanted to come back and talk about this. Yes. Yeah. One, the biggest story. Oh, one of goodness. the biggest stories that we've been talking about. It is. Continuing oh. themes, I should say. Not good enough for investors. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about another mover here this morning, WeWork. Well, the company filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy this week. Its dramatic collapse has been a long time coming. The business was once considered the most valuable startup in the nation. Valued as high as $47 billion. So we want to bring in Christopher Case. He's a George Washington University School of Business professor of management here to break all of this down. It's great to see you here, Chris. All right, so I guess big picture in terms of what this means for WeWork or how we got here. What's your reaction to the filing this week? Sure. Well, it's a very interesting story, and you know, a lot of people have have fictionalized this, and there's a lot of movies out there. So there's a lot of a lot of discussion about how this actually happened and how we got to where we are today. But I think if we take a look at what the most recent developments are, sort of the documents that have just come out around bankruptcy, what do they tell us about WeWork? And what they tell us is that you know, despite all the hype early on in 2016, 2017, WeWork is really just a real estate leasing company. I mean, that's the business model. And they really are sort of overextended in being able to sort of execute that model very well. I mean, you know, we're looking at, as you mentioned, the company it was once valued at about, what, $47 billion and today is worth maybe $50 million. So this is a company that just really never had a business model that met overhyped expectations that were placed on it. So I think today we're going to see in the next couple of years, we're going to see Does this business model really work? Uh, Obviously at a much lower valuation, maybe a three or $4 billion valuation versus the sky high valuation that people were thinking, you know, five, six years ago. So I think that's the story that we're gonna be looking at moving forward is, you know, was there anything to the hype at all? Hmm. To what extent is it also a byproduct of the shift that we've seen in the amount of virtual employees and people who are leisure travelers or would rather work from the beach than from uh, a WeWork or a Notel or any of the instances where, yeah, you might have great connectivity, but do you have sand? Can you, you know, get it in between your toes? Probably not. Well, uh, they didn't have sand, but I do understand that they had beer there. So that was also, you know, kind of attractive to, I think, a lot of workers. But but what we're, you know, what we think is that, the, that uh, you know, the, the pandemic surely had some impact on this. And, and, and so does the sort of, you know, the slow, slow work walking back, the, the return to office, which is just never really uh, caught on like people had hoped in terms of, you know, bringing people back to the office. So WeWork is definitely, you know, uh, suffering from that. Uh, and the other, I think, question really around this is just how big is the market for people that want flexible workspace? And I think there's also sort of a limit to the number of people that are going to be working in this kind of environment. And that's really what we work really needs to figure out is, you know, this, is, this isn't, uh, this isn't in a, sort of a, a limitless business in terms of the potential customers. There's, there's a limit to this, and this is what they're, they're going to find out. Um, the other challenge, of course, right now is that real estate, particularly business real estate, uh, office leasing has become very complicated, right? Uh, occupancy levels are down, uh, prices are down, valuations are down. 
companies, banks, they're just walking away from real estate projects because they, they can't get tenants. Uh, and so WeWork is kind of caught up in that. And, you know, they've been trying to nego renegotiate a lot of these longer term contracts that they had with, with real estate firms, but they apparently weren't very successful or they wouldn't be, you know, declaring bankruptcy. And, you know, it's interesting if you look at some of the numbers, you know, they're losing about half a billion dollars a year last year, about, you know, $500 million. They only have about 200 million in uh, 200 million in cash, so you know they were very quickly going to run into a situation where they just weren't going to be able to pay their debtors. So there really weren't a whole lot of other options than bankruptcy right now. So Chris, what is this then? How much of this is a WeWork specific problem versus maybe the fact that this could signal more distress that we could potentially see within the commercial real estate sector? Well, I think we're seeing that distress now. And, you know, as as these companies, as companies go to renegotiate leases, I think we're going to see more of this. There is a lot of concern. You know, there's all kinds of talk about how maybe we can convert these buildings to housing, but that's difficult for a variety of reasons, whether it be local regulations or the sort of setup of the building. Now, we were kind of kind of special place in, in the in the in the hierarchy, if you will, of office leasing. They kind of took this sort of second tier space. It kind of had the vibe that, that WeWork was looking for. So, you know, they're in a place that's even more uh, dire, in, in fact, than some of the higher end office spaces, which is what people are really wanting to move to. So I think this is uh, an example of what's to come and, um, you know, in terms of the real estate market. But I also think it has this broader thing that it reflects, right? It reflects this sort of overly optimistic expectations that people had kind of going into the pandemic, again, 2017, 2018, about, you know, the value of these companies. And, and you know, we can go and look at some of the recent bankruptcies, some of the recent even criminal trials. Now, I don't think there's anything criminal going on at WeWork, but I think it's also representative of this kind of overly optimistic situation with these companies they were just kind of poorly managed, right? I mean, if we look at FTX and we look at Theranos, I mean, these were companies that potentially could have done really interesting things, but they were just so poorly managed. They didn't sort of have standard accounting practices. They didn't have legal advice that was helpful. And I think that was also true at WeWork, you know? And one of the reasons when they tried to go public a couple of years ago, back in 2017, people looked at the financial statements and they looked at what was going on in the company and they said, we really can't take this public. There's just too much that's going to raise too many questions. Now, luckily, at that time, you know, SoftBank came in and bailed them out. So there was this sense that right. um, how are we going to deal with this, you know, um, and, and they the, the, the sort of got this cash infusion. So I do, I do think it's representative of this mm -hmm. larger problem of overvaluations. Yeah, yeah. If, if only some of that real estate was to be converted into residential or apartments, mm, if there was something like a we live, I don't know. Thanks for joining us, Christopher Hayes, who is the George Washington University School of Business professor and management. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. We've got all your markets action straight ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Take Two is hijacking gaming news this morning, announcing it has plans for a new Grand Theft Auto game, the sixth of the market dominating franchise. The company is also expected to report its second quarter earnings results after the bell today. We want to bring in Dan Halley, who we know is a resident gamer, gaming expert, I should say, for a little bit more insight. Dan, what do you think of the announcement? Absolutely massive. Let's go over what's happening with Take Two right now and then explain why Grand Theft Auto is so important. With the, the news coming from uh, this Bloomberg report, uh, shares of Take Two are now up more than 7% this morning. Uh, the report came out last night. Let's go over why Grand Theft Auto is such a big deal for gaming and for Take Two in particular. To date, the franchise, Grand Theft Auto in general, has sold 405 million units. Now, the last entry, Grand Theft Auto V, came out in 2013. That was when the original PlayStation 3 uh, and Xbox 360 were out. Uh, then we had, uh, excuse me, Xbox One were out. Uh, then we had uh, the PlayStation 4. No new Grand Theft Auto game. Now we're on the PlayStation 5. So they've taken this franchise across three different consoles. Uh, and so now we're expected to see the newest one. Grand Theft Auto 5 sold 185 million units so far uh, since Take Two's last earnings report and earned uh, $1 billion in retail sales alone. They also, by the way, have Grand Theft Auto Online and a premium membership for that that's raking in money. So this is a franchise that's that's just absolutely crushing it for Take Two. This game has been talked about for some time now. People are wondering when it was gonna come, if it was gonna come. Uh, and so the fact that it's going to be released or announced at least uh, makes you think that we could see it sooner rather than later if this isn't some you know, kind of uh, whirlwind event where they're gonna have you know people on stage or whatever announcing it. They could just say, look, we're, we have Grand Theft Auto 6, here's a trailer and it's coming out blank. Um, so what we're expecting for the quarter uh, without Grand Theft Auto 6 is $1.3 billion in revenue out of Take Two uh, on a dollar to earnings per share. And so, you know, if this game does end up being announced, uh, you know, you can expect people to essentially drop everything. There'll be probably some people calling out of work when it eventually is announced. Uh, and then for, for Take Two itself, I mean, you know, the sky's the limit basically for, for how many people get into this game. It has been quite a long time, so the demand is built up, but there's also the flip side that it's been a long time. A lot of new games have come out. Uh, gaming is always evolving. Can they keep up with that? Uh, can they ensure that people still want to stick around for that franchise? Uh, the last major release that the company had was Red Dead Redemption 2, and that's one of the most critically acclaimed games uh, out there. So we'll have to see uh, if Grand Theft Auto 6 is actually coming and if it can live up to the the height that Grand Theft Auto 5 has really built up for it. Yeah, Dan, I mean, if we were, and as we were rolling that kind of tape of what was in GTA, I guess in the in the previous one, GTA 5, I didn't even know that you could play golf in GTA. I, I thought that kind you can, of Yeah, you can do whatever, against. man. <laughs> apparently, apparently you can do a range of things in GTA, um, but Ultimately, uh, we'll, we'll see if they do get that big announcement. Dan, appreciate it. Thanks so much. Uh, Yahoo Finance's Chief Gaming Officer, the CGO, Dan Howley. Appreciate it. We've got all your markets action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Welcome back, everyone. We're live from the NASDAQ market side. You're watching Yahoo Finance Live. The U.S. Energy Information Administration says domestic gasoline demand is on the decline in 2023 and could fall by 1% in 2024. That is the lowest per capita gas consumption in two decades. Yet, under President Biden, who's pushed for investments in clean energy under the IRA, U.S. domestic oil production hit an all-time high earlier this year. So do fossil fuels still have a long-term future, or are they destined to be phased out? Joining us now with more is Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman. So perhaps we start there. Let's address that question for, um, further, Rick. And uh, you've been continuing to track this, whether there will be a phase-out of fossil fuels. I think this has been one of the most important lessons of the Biden presidency. Um, if there is a phase out of fossil fuels, it's not going to happen for decades. Um, two things are going on at the same time here. Uh, there is uh, growing adoption of renewable energy, solar, wind, uh, other forms of energy, um, while at the same time, we still need a lot of fossil fuels. And um, I mean, it's kind of remarkable when you think that Biden um, has signed the law for the for the uh, most lavish set of green energy incentives in U.S. history with the Inflation Reduction Act last year. And yet U.S. oil production uh, has has hit a new record high of 13.2 million barrels of oil per day. And it's probably going to stay there and actually drift a little higher. And that is that is not happening because of any government incentive. It's happening because there is a market. There is market demand for fossil fuels. So um, this transition is not happening the way environmentalists want it to, but I think uh, environmentalists just have to be realistic. The way to get this done is to put as much uh, renewable energy onto the market at prices that consumers and businesses can't afford to pay. And Biden's law is actually doing that. He's creating a lot of government incentives that bring the price down. But what you cannot do is deny um, the fossil fuels that people need today. So. Uh, just point to that first thing you mentioned there. Uh, the EIA is saying there's going to be a decline in demand for gasoline in 2024. One of the reasons for that decline is the sale of electric vehicles. There are more electric vehicles that don't burn gasoline. So that that is actually making a dent in demand for fossil fuels. That probably means um, gasoline prices in 2024 will, I don't know if they're going to plunge. I, they probably will not plunge because oil prices have been a state pretty, pretty high. But they could moderate and not be a political problem for President Biden. So this uh, transition to green energy is literally going to take decades, like I think 30, 40 or 50 years. It'd be great if it went faster, but this is the reality of the marketplace. So, Rick, do you think that that then kind of points to, because I think a lot of people, when you look at the recent deals that we've seen from the oil giants with Chevron buying Hess, you also have Exxon $60 billion deal to buy Pioneer, then that kind of supports the reasons for those deals, right? There's still a lot of demand when it comes to fossil fuels. And like you just said, that transition is going to take decades to be done. Right. Uh, and remember, we're talking about global markets here. Uh, I mean, you, you, and it cannot be another way. You, you cannot fence off energy and say, we're just going to have a domestic market in the United States. It just, it, markets don't work that way. So what the oil, the, these, these big energy companies, are, they're looking around the world. And I, I mean, look what's happening in China. I mean, Ch China, China is still burning tons of coal. I mean, one of, we, we, we still are struggling with this problem of getting rid of coal. Coal is the worst polluting uh, fossil fuel. If you, can, if you can replace coal with natural gas, You've done a lot to cut back on emissions, uh, but a lot of the world is still burning coal. And India, it, it, India needs more coal, not less. Um, so, uh, and this is reflected all throughout the, the, I mean, we're not even at peak oil yet. Uh, the best estimates are that demand for oil is going to keep going up uh, until at least 2030 or 2035. And then it's not gonna plunge, it's gonna plateau at, at a pretty high level. So that's the reason big oil companies are saying they want to lock in uh, what they think are going to be the most profitable uh, drilling fields for the next, uh, you know, again, we're talking 20, 30, 40 years. Um, and we are going to see renewables claiming more market share, but um, it's just going to be slower than everybody would like. And you do have to think about other places in the world where it's going to take a lot longer than it's taking here in the United States. Yeah, the disconnect between the developing and the developed world. All right, Rick Newman, great stuff. Thanks so much. Hi, guys. Well, we've got all your market action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Good morning and welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Brad Smith alongside Shauna Smith. We're here at the NASDAQ market site in New York City and we're about 30 minutes into the start of the trading day. Let's take a look at how things are shaping up. First and foremost, stocks are higher today as investors try to maintain the longest winning streak in markets since 2021, despite some hawkish sentiment from Fed members. Taking a look at some of the individual movers today, it's the most wonderful time of the year for shopping, but apparently not for eBay. The e-commerce company is saying in its latest report that it's seeing softening consumer trends so far in its current quarter, the fourth quarter, and also issued guidance that fell short of the street's expectations, saying, quote, a more muted seasonal uptick over the holidays. We're also tracking Upstart. Upstart is going down this morning. Shares are at least. They're down by 25%. And for its next quarter, it's forecasting a 10% year-on-year revenue decline, which is an improvement, but still below analyst expectations. They also anticipate a loss of $48 million in the quarter. On the disappointing release, Upstart's CEO said they, quote, prefer to be growing quickly, but this is a time when it's wise to be operating in a conservative mode. And lastly, taking a look at Roblox isn't playing any games when it comes to cutting back on expenses. A company reporting a narrower than expected loss in its third quarter with the CFO citing a slowdown in spending growth across major expense categories, as well as an intention to only grow operating costs at or slower than the rate of bookings growth. Now, resilient gaming demand was a boon for the company, which saw bookings jump 20% from a year ago. Daily users of 70.2 million and also hours engaged hit 16 billion. That was up 20% from a year ago, and you're looking at gains of nearly 18%. All right, well, let's get to some of the market commentary of the day, and it's back to our Invest Conference. Our very own Brian Sazi sat down with AT&T CEO John Stanky and asked him about the state of the economy. Now, Stanky honed in on the federal deficit, saying that the, quote, day of reckoning is now, not 30 years from now, and the federal debt could hinder growth and hurt business. Let's listen. What I'd like to see happen, it's really not the Fed's issue, is from a policy perspective, I'd like us to see a little more spending discipline in this country, and I'd like to see it globally, frankly, because demands on the debt markets are crowding out private industry and private investment, and a lot of it's coming from public sector debt. So I think that's the biggest thing we need to think about for the long term, to make sure investment is right and growth is appropriate. And we spoke to huge names in business across industries at yesterday's Invest Conference. We got different perspectives on the state of the economy, the impact of high interest rates, the Fed, and much more. Let's listen to a few of those highlights now. Normally, we would think about with all these interest rates going up, we would see a slowdown very quickly in the U.S., but we don't see it. And the reason is, of course, that not all that interest increase is going straight to consumers. It hits the ones that have variable interest rates, which corporation might have and, th uh, and things like that. So I see much more tougher in especially Europe. I think it's a little less about the elevated interest rate environment and a little more about expectations that with pressure on the commercial office sector, uh, pressure on the commercial real, uh, excuse me, retail sector, that there will be increasing liquidity requirements placed on lenders. The economic David actually right now look like in the direction of soft landing. Growth is still about potential, inflation has been falling, and therefore we're going in the right direction. But interest rates are higher, higher for longer, that may slow down the economy, there are geopolitical risks that might lead to a spike in energy prices, and therefore there are factors that could lead us to a short and shallow recession. And now, from a political point of view, even a short and shallow recession will be very damaging for Biden. I think it's not inappropriate to basically say, look, let's understand how everything is working through the economy before we continue to go in one direction or another. I think they're very mindful of the lesson uh, of the 1970s when you uh, tightened and then you loosened too quickly. So I think they don't want to repeat that. Uh, but they don't yet have all the data that looks at what are the implications of long of the 10 year moving on its own upward because of a different set of forces than just the forces of the Fed. So I, I'll, I'd, I'd give them a break and say what they're doing right now seems reasonable. 
And here with his take on where the economy is today is Paul Riley, Raymond James CEO. Paul, great to speak with you as always. You know, if there is one kind of resounding CEO voice there that really kind of jives with, with what you're thinking about the economy is, is there one that sticks out to you? Well, you know, it's a hard call right now. And uh, Brad and Sean, it's great to be back on with you guys. Um, the There's no doubt that interest rates are slowing the economy. And those impacts haven't really worked through the economy. Uh, you look at housing and you, there, you would say that sales would have slowed down a lot. Prices would come down with these rates. Hasn't started really yet. Corporations who had generally a lot of cash haven't had to go and refinance with the much more expensive debt rates. So it will slow down the economy. The question is, will it be a recession or will it be a bad recession? And I think the short answer for me is, it's hard to have a really big recession when everyone who wants to work can work and wages are going up. So I think the soft landing scenario is kind of where I would land, but certainly we're at an inflection point on what the Fed continues to do or stops doing. So Paul, if we do see that soft landing scenario that it sounds like is what you're expecting, at least at this point. What does that then mean for Raymond James? I, I think it's the same thing. You know, I look at the client sentiment today um, and over half of the clients aren't, you know, don't have confidence in the equity markets right now. 80% have confidence in achieving their plan and 95% good news is they like their advisors. So part of advice is working people through these downturns. It isn't always an up market. So it's not a lot of change. Uh, we have double the amount of capital to be uh, to be uh, well capitalized required by the Fed. Uh, we have twice the amount of cash we need to be highly liquid. You know, so we will go through the cycle. So for us, it's still focusing on the long term for Raymond James, and more particularly is focusing our advisors focusing on clients long term investment plans. So as of right now, yeah, we could have a downturn. But those tend to be cyclical. And the question is, you know, like the company, uh, advisors should be saying for their clients, what's the right path for you in the long term? So it doesn't change much right now. Are you anticipating that that downturn would be shallow, mild? How are you kind of quantifying it, if you will? Yeah, so I, it depends on my hat, right? As a CEO and a company that's been through deep cycles being profitable like 09 we made money every quarter uh, I'm, I'm paid to be a pessimist but my personal outlook is i think it'll be a shallow recession but from company planning we always say what happens if you know it gets worse but i i think it'll be a shallow dip and the question is how long right we've had periods of stagflation before if inflation because of supply chain and other issues doesn't really come down and the economy is not growing, you go through tough periods too. So you don't know, but my best guess, my personal guess is more of a shallow slowdown for a period of time and then an increase. But any scenario you could argue. Well, when you talk about some of the adjustments here that you are making, what more than does that look like when you brace for what sounds like is going to be and what is expected to be a very uncertain time for the economy here over the next several months? Yeah, from a from a company standpoint, we're we're still focused on growth. So we have found in downturns mm -hmm. when things slow down, it's easier to attract people uh, because of our capital and cash. We can still invest, and we look at downturns as opportunities for future growth. Now, it doesn't mean we don't watch expenses more. Uh, we haven't really we don't really do layoffs historically. We've had very few. Uh, we may slow down hiring. Uh, but we continue to work through those downturns and keep more people than most companies would in anticipation of the up cycle. And again, our capitalization and profitability, we've had our third consecutive uh, year of profitability in three very different interest rate environments. Uh, so that's, you know, we're built for those kind of fluctuations for the long term. And we're going to just focus on doing what's right for the client increasing our support for advisors, recruiting more advisors. And, you know, it, it may be a little faster, a little slower, depending on what happens with the economy, but we really don't vary from that uh, focus. 
And when you think about how advisors are engaging with those clients, what, what are some of the, and of course it comes down to an, an individual's portfolio, you know, what their horizons are, but is there is there a prevailing kind of common denominator in some of the top ideas that are being recommended right now? Yeah, so I think advisors really earn their money in the harder times uh, in getting clients to do the right things. Very often when there's a downturn, they want to, some people want to bail, right? And there isn't a retail investor, right? There are a bunch of individuals with different plans, goals, and, and risk tolerances. So given their plans, what's the best course or where they are? So you have seen shift from you know, lower yielding cash to higher yielding cash alternatives, which you would expect advisors to do. Uh, but you haven't seen big pull. There's been an increase in fixed income because of that. But advisors, uh, and looking at the long term, have held clients generally in the equity market. So a lot of it is, look, you have a you have a plan. Stay focused on the plan, not on the next few quarters, unless you have a particular issue or event you're worried about, and you need to be very conservative to fund. You know, hold the course. And I think that's the overall theme for advisors and reassuring clients that they have a plan and you're watching. And you know, the financial plan is still you know, achievable given, you know, the longer term or middle term, depending on what their time horizon is. Well, we're hearing from uh, Fed Chair Jay Powell right now. He's speaking, obviously, on the economy. I'm curious to get your perspective. You mentioned the fact that the full impact of higher rates hasn't fully worked through, worked through uh, the economy yet. Do you think the Fed should be done raising rates at this point? Yeah, it's been an interesting cycle. I think they would self-admit they waited too long, left rates at zero for too long. Um, and then they had to speed up, which had its disruptions. And you could see it in the banking system last March when rates went up too quickly and you know banks had to catch up. Um, I think the last pauses have shown they understand that even though they haven't hit their 2% target and the economy is still good, that it's still working through. And I think they are doing the right thing by saying, look, and I thought they might do it earlier, but they're doing it now, the right thing by saying, look, let's let it work through. Let's see where it goes. If the economy and inflation stays overheated, we can always raise it, but let's not over raise it and then have to back off quickly because we put too much of a break on the economy. And there's a lot of impacts. I mean, it's not just, it's capital rules uh, by regulators, it's the Fed on rates, you don't want to close down the liquidity and lend lending system of the economy by having all these impacts at once. So I think uh, Powell and the Fed have been very, very thoughtful. Of course, we're all working off of data and making assumptions, and uh, we'll hear what he says, but I'm sure he'll say for now it's the right thing, but rates hikes may not be over because he's not going to declare victory at this point. Too early to declare victory. All right, Paul Riley, always great to speak with you. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us here this morning. CEO of Raymond James. Thank you. Well, we've got all your market action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
FTX, the exchange formerly owned by Sam Bankman-Fried, is getting a few new suitors. This is according to the Wall Street Journal. Bullish, a crypto exchange and figure technologies, a fintech startup, are both vying for the exchange. According to Coindesk, Proof Group is also competing. For more on this, we've got Yahoo Finance reporter Jared Blickery standing by. Jared, what do we know so far? Not a whole lot. Uh, there's a lot of assets up for grabs here. And by the way, crypto is healing. So SBF looks like he's going to do some jail time. And now the competition is to see what happens to FDX. And as of last month, we found out that we're as, there were as many as 70 different suitors. And now that list is down to three. As you said, one of the firms is bullish. Uh, that's the name of it. Another is fin, uh, Figure Technologies, a fintech startup. And then Proof Group, which is a crypto venture capital firm. What's interesting about the mix is bullish is headed by Tom Farley, who used to be the president of the New York Stock Exchange, where I'm standing right now. And uh, all of this, is, I think, is interesting in the historical context that <clears throat> I remember when Lehman Brothers went over, went under. Uh, it took 10 years to resolve that, by the way. And I don't remember any clamor to buy, to buy the name of the assets to kind of prop it up again or to rebuild it from its ashes. Uh, but FTX, I think this is saying that there's a lot of brand name cachet still in existence. Now, what happens with the uh, customers who are still owed money? They would probably get a part ownership, in other words, shareholder equity in the new venture. Uh, but that's just a guess on my part. They're going to have to get some kind of compensation for the money they lost. And out of this, uh, we'll probably see FDX. I don't know if their name is going to be on uh, how many Super Bowl commercials they're going to do or how many stadiums uh, they're going to add their name to in the future. But interesting to see that people still want to see this name remain viable. So that's about what we know right now. And if we can go to the Wi-Fi Interactive, I just want, since we're talking about exchanges here, just wanted to do a quick uh, look at some of the exchanges, what's happened over the last three months. And you can see some green and some red. CME Group, which is mainly futures, up 3.4%. CBO, which does options, uh, they're up 19%. ICE, the parent company of the New York Stock Exchange, down 6%. But all in all, when a lot of stocks have taken a tumble over the last three months, uh, some of these guys have enjoyed some outsized gains. And I think some of that just has to do with the interest rate situation and the uh, re-steepening of the uh, yield curve. But back to the main point, uh, I'll be interested to see what uh, happens to FTX, if it can re rise from the ashes like the Phoenix, like anybody else would. All right, Jared Blickery, thanks so much for bringing all that down for us. Appreciate it. Just don't it. hit the sun when you go back up. That's the key thing about that metaphor. Very key and very, very good advice. All right, Jared, thanks. With the presidential election less than a year away, a new CNN poll has Trump leading Biden among voters in a hypothetical 2024 matchup. Skybridge founder and former Trump staffer Anthony Scaramucci joined Yahoo Finance's Anjali Kamlani at Yahoo Finance Invest yesterday and shared his outlook on the 2024 election and also his thoughts on the downfall of former crypto darling Sam Bankman-Fried. Let's take a listen. What do you feel about Trump's run this time? Do you feel like he has something new to offer, maybe an economic plan or something like that that could so benefit he, him he, outside of just having that MAGA crowd? Okay, remember, the, the, the number one thing you need to run for the presidency and win the presidency, the number one thing is name recognition. Number one thing. Remember, this is a popularity contest in the United States. It's not a hiring decision. Secondarily, we're focused on it because a lot of you are in finance and studying the markets, and so we're focused on the political situation. But the average American is coming home from work tired. Uh, if they vote, they show up, they look at the names, they say, oh, you know, I recognize that name, and they vote for that name. And so he is well ahead of his peer group for a lot of different reasons, and he has a, like him or dislike him, he has a galvanizing personality. Okay, people are like, yeah, I want that. I want that red meat. Um, I saw something on the campaign that I think is worth sharing with you, so I'll share it. We landed in Albuquerque, New Mexico in May of 2016. And I saw something on the Trump campaign that he did not see when I was working for Governor Bush. You want to know what that was? People, ladies and gentlemen, okay? We were getting five or 10 people in New Hampshire for Jeb. He had 9,000 people show up at the Albuquerque Civic Center, and he had 6,000 people in the overflow on the flat screens outside. When I walked in there, I said to a couple of my friends, I need to meet these people. Why are they here? And I took my 
security pin off. I walked in the crowd, and I asked one gentleman, and I'll give you the composite. I said, why are you here? He said, well, you know, I, I lost my job. You know, you think you're in New Mexico? Well, New New Mexico, that would be Mexico, because that's where my job went. And guys, we lost 65,000 factories in the United States since the signing of NAFTA. And here was a youngish person in his early 40s. He had a job. Uh, the factory moved. He was now working at Lowe's, and he was delivering pizza for Domino's at night. And he had two kids at home, and he was like, listen, I need help. We turned people, like my dad, who was a blue-collar guy, we turned aspirational working-class blue-collar families into economically desperational working-class blue-collar families in 35 years. We have to address that. They're going to vote for Donald Trump, Bernie Sanders, AOC. They're going to vote for the people that they think represent them and are the avatar for their anger. Now, four years into the presidency, the president didn't do anything to solve their problems or come up with any policies that would have benefited them. But they like him because he is sticking a finger in the eye of Wall Street, the media, I happen to be both of those, so it really sucks <laughs> for me. Say, both thank you for both my eyes are getting gouged <laughs> out. Okay. Uh, Hollywood, uh, what about the medical establishment? Okay, these people don't want to take the vaccine. They don't want to be a part of the system because they feel that the system has left them out. We have to re-engage those people. And so I think he is a poor candidate this time for the Republicans. Just look at the polling. But it doesn't matter what I think, he's going to win the nomination if things stay exactly the way they are right now. Something changes or he drops out, which I still think there's a possibility of that. He looks extremely tired, very frustrated. He's got 91 more indictments that he has to handle here. It's going to be very time consuming. Uh, the poll numbers, his internal poll numbers, suggest that if he gets convicted of something, it's gonna hurt him with the independents. So he may, but he's the only person against Joe Biden right now where I think Joe Biden can beat him. And I know he's ahead of him in some of the swing states right now, but a year from now, you guys know, a year from now is a very long time in politics. Just think about October 7th, Access Hollywood tape exposure, November the 8th, one month and one day later, he goes on to win the presidency. So I do want to get your thoughts on where crypto goes from here. I, I've heard some commentary that, you know, the Sam Bankman Freed issue is just a very US centric issue and crypto mm -hmm. has kind of moved on. Do you think oh. it, the industry is recovering from that? So I liked Sam. I want to be very, very clear on that. Did Sam commit a fraud? Yes, he did. Okay, I'm not in the Michael Lewis category or my very good friend Kevin O'Leary category. I saw what he did firsthand and he committed a crime and he committed fraud. And he's gonna to go to jail for a very long time. But I'm not gonna revise history, ladies and gentlemen, and pretend I didn't like him, didn't know him, got to know his family. Mike Novogratz said last week on the eve of his conviction that he liked him as a person, he thought he was a nice guy. He was a nerdy, introverted, nice human being. But he did something very malevolent, and I'm just going to say to you, the reason I talk about it is I don't want to be that guy that runs from things when you make a mistake. I want to be the guy that can talk to my clients or my family or the journalists or whoever very honestly about it. And here's the mistake that we made, and you should really think about this as an investor. There was some group think. We had venture capitalists and sovereign wealth funds and billionaires that lost money. I'm not going to mention their names. They get so mad at me when I mention their names because they're all hiding from it, trying to pretend it didn't happen to them. But it did happen to them. So there was some group think. The second thing that happened is there were four people that controlled the money at, at FTX, Alameda. And if you want to commit a financial crime, you tighten the circle, you have three or four people running it together, go back to the Madoff crime. It was him, his brother, his assistant, and an accountant. Several billion dollar crime, they got it to go for 30 years. Sam was doing that, and I would encourage you when you're doing due diligence on a private company or hedge fund, what are the checks and balances in the system? How many keys gotta get turned before money gets released somewhere? 
And you want to go with the people that are very formal about that. You know, 50 or so different people have to look at something at SkyBridge before something goes out the door. There's always going to be a person of conscience when you have a lot of, lot of people looking at it, not just three or four. It was a tale of two consumers with cosmetic brands in the latest quarter here. Estee Lauder slashed its full year outlook as it struggles with sales of higher priced products and faced weaker demand in China. But it was a different story for ELF Beauty, raising its guidance on strong demand and a 76% jump in net sales year over year, proving the consumer may be shifting towards some of the lower priced products in the market. Tarang Amin, who is the ELF Beauty chairman and CEO joins us now. Of course, I have the bad habit of saying ELF because of eyes, lip, face, which is what it stands for, and many of our viewers know that too. But when you think about this brand, the trajectory, and what you're seeing in the consumer environment right now, what are some of the biggest catalysts that are sticking out to you? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm so proud of the team. We just delivered our 19th consecutive quarter of net sales growth. I think we're one of only five public consumer companies out of 274 that's grown 19 consecutive quarters at least 20 percent. And there are really three main drivers that are propelling it. First and foremost is our value equation. We make the best of beauty accessible to every eye, lip, face, and skin concern. Second is our powerhouse innovation. We have this unique ability to take inspiration from our community or the best of prestige and be able to introduce them at extraordinary values. And the third is our marketing engine. And all three are working extremely well for us right now. Let me pick up on that first point there. When you said the fact that this your product is accessible to everyone, does that then give you an advantage at a time like this when we're seeing consumers pull back 
on some of their spending and what are some of the trends that you're noticing from your customers when it comes to spending? Yeah, well, you know, I've long been bullish on the color cosmetics and skincare categories. They're great categories, particularly as people are interested in getting out and expressing themselves. We're particularly well positioned because of that value equation. And we have this ability, I think it's even more than trade down, it's this ability of expanding the category. We introduced our poreless putty primer a few years ago and uh, we had inspiration from a prestige item. We've looked at that prestige item, it's continued to grow, so prestige is continuing to do well but we sell nine times the number of units because we can give access to millions of consumers. So are you seeing more shoppers and more consumers? At absolutely, like absolutely, because the prestige item is priced, I think, at $56. Our poreless putty primer is at $10. So you can bring millions more people who can afford that who might not be able to afford a $56 primer. During any type of economic uncertainty, there are these little luxuries that consumers look to, and, and beauty products are, are one of those because of the price point and you want to feel good at the end of the day. When you think about what we've seen in past recessions and the consumer engagement that a company like Elf has had, are you seeing any signs of recession or contraction showing up in the consumer? Well, not in our business. I think that very notion of it is one of the small luxuries you can afford, and people do want to, particularly after the pandemic, want to get out and express themselves. So a brand like Elf is really well positioned because we offer that prestige quality of these extraordinary values, and we have a unique ability of how we engage our community. Jerry, how do you grow that customer base beyond certain generations? When I think of Elf Beauty, obviously it's very popular amongst Gen Z, even millennials, but expanding it to Gen X and even baby boomers, what's your plan there? Well, we've made great progress there. I think one of the things we've done over time is taken up our marketing levels. A few years ago, we were at 7% of net sales. This last quarter, we're at 21% of net sales. And we've done that because it's working. Not only are we the number one brand amongst Gen Z, I think in the latest Piper Sandler survey, we grew our share 13 points in one year to 29%. I How think are you so effective there? Well, it's we live where our community lives. Like we're, you know, we were one of the first brands on TikTok in beauty. Uh, we're the first brand on Twitch with our own channel on female empowerment. Uh, we constantly innovate in terms of the platforms we're on, and we look to where engages our community and how we entertain them. And so our 29 share amongst teens, I think the next highest brand is 13%, but we're also gaining other audiences. And so we've broadened our aperture. This year was the first time we did a spot on the big game with Jennifer Coolidge. And one of the things we found with Jennifer Coolidge is she appeals to all age groups. So we're picking up more millennials, we're picking up more Gen X, as well as our strength in Gen Z. So obviously it's a growing business, a growing franchise, and the marketing is really working. Uh, ROIs are well above any industry benchmark. and. We'll continue to invest in our brands as we have a great opportunity to bring more consumers to health. Yeah, at the center of every Venn diagram, you will find Jennifer Coolidge for sure. So very <laughs> smart play on, on your front there. When you think about that new customer acquisition, how, how are you balancing out that with also maintaining the margins that the business expects? Yeah, well, you know, this last quarter, we grew our gross margins 570 basis points. We grew our adjusted EBITDA 122%. So we have this great virtuous circle where we invest more in our brands. We have this powerhouse innovation of growing franchises. That drives very strong top line growth, which in turn gives us leverage on our non-marketing SGNA, And so we're able to grow our margins at the same time. Have you, are, are you seeing any inflationary pressure? And I guess, what are you doing in order to combat that at all in terms of passing it along to the consumer? It doesn't sound like it in terms of affordable prices. So what are you doing to offset some of that? Yeah, so I mean, I think we had more of an inflationary pressure, I'd say more than a year ago, okay. where we saw higher transportation costs, FX. We're now have, seeing a tailwind there. So we've chosen not to take our prices up. Uh, many of our competitors have, and we want to maintain that incredible value. And we're able to grow our margins at the same time. So we feel like in a particularly good position. And manufacturing wise, I mean, when you think about the ability to produce inventory, get it out the door and shipping, transportation, as you were mentioning, and making sure that it's selling through your wholesale partners as well. On the manufacturing front, what have you been noticing there? I mean, that was one of the weak spots in the employment report recently, yeah. largely due to labor strikes and autos, but that does spell out where there's still larger negotiations that have to take place within many of these realms and facilities too. 
Yeah, well, it's one of our real strengths. I mean, we've spent 20 years honing our supply chain, and we have the best combination of cost, quality, and speed in our industry. It's what allows us to have this prestige quality, these great prices. And so even with our extraordinary growth, 76%, really the last three quarters, we've been able to maintain over 95% customer in stock. So I'm really proud of what our ops team has been able to do. Shares up more than 80% since the start of the year. Tarang Amin, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Elf Beauty Chairman and CEO. Thanks, Tarang. Thank you. All right, we'll keep right here on Yahoo Finance. We've got all your market action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. We'll be right back. Vivid Seats is betting big on Las Vegas, announcing it will acquire Vegas.com in a cash and stock transaction valued at roughly $240 million. Now, the ticket platform raised its full year guidance as well, saying that the company's business is better positioned than ever. We want to bring in Stan Chia, Vivid Seats CEO. He joins us now. Stan, it's good to see you. So let me pick up on that last point. Your business, you say, is better positioned than ever. Why? Yeah. Hey, Shauna. Thanks for having me on the show today. Look, we've been really excited as we've continued to see trends in the industry that I think maintain the category as one that consumers are looking to prioritize their spend on. And frankly, when you look at the platform and you know, I'm privileged to have an amazing team that's been delivering, the differentiation that we've built into the platform with the industry's only loyalty program, best customer service as recognized by Newsweek, you know, engagement platforms like our free to play game center or our Real Money Daily Fantasy app, Vivid Picks. We've just got so many things there to take advantage of consumer demand while offering them value. And the acquisition 
of Vegas.com to us is another catalyst that we think is transformative for the business. And as you see that reflected in our outperformance this quarter, but perhaps more importantly, as we give preliminary guidance for next year, you can see that on a base of almost $4 billion this year, we're still going to grow top line, you know, double digits. And more importantly, we're seeing the flow through as we've um, preliminary guided to 26% EBITDA growth, right? Putting us almost at $200 million in EBITDA when we started the year at closer to $100 million. Stan, no doubt this was the summer of the experience economy. People going to concerts, whether it be Taylor Swift, whether it be Beyonce. But at the end of the day, are you seeing any pullback or moderation, at least, in prices that consumers are willing to spend to go into these experiences? Or do you expect it to remain high? Yeah, look, it's it's hard to have a crystal ball, you know, on all of this. And we're certainly cognizant of all of the other uh, factors that are impacting, you know, consumers and how they think about discretionary spend. As it pertains to our category, we've continued to see resiliency and strength. When you think about our business, you know, we, we look at indicators like average order size of the business as a good indicator of how much demand is outpacing supply and how much consumers are willing to pay. And if you look at, you know, I think what we put out in our earnings presentation on a quarter, on a year over year basis this quarter, we're about 10% up on average order size. When historically, if you look at that CAGR, it's more of a three to 4% number. So I think you're still seeing strength in the consumer in this category and certainly a desire to prioritize their spend there. Stan, do you think that could continue? Yeah, look, I think the category is again one where consumers see this. No, no doubt it is discretionary spend. But there is the nature of, of the category, you know, where there's just a FOMO-esque quality, you know, and I, I look at myself, you know, I love Guns N' Roses. I took my kids to Guns N' Roses this, this year, you know, we've talked about Taylor Swift, a, an amazing performer, you know, I think everybody wants to see that. So again, you know, not going to be immune to the impacts on the economy, but certainly this is a category that I think consumers look to prioritize and, and a very differentiated one from the rest of the discretionary bucket. What is the top thing that you're seeing consumers looking for when they when they come into the purchasing process right now? And, and you know, I ask that because there's been a, a big push for just transparency in the fees and the total all-in costs, especially when you're looking to go into what's a highly coveted experience, whether it be a concert, whether it be a sporting event. Yeah, look, I, I really think this category in particular, but I think across everything that consumers are looking for, they're going to look for value and value that matters to them. When you look at what we've invested in, you know, I think transparency is really important. We have a really transparent and upfront platform where we make sure consumers are aware of what they're purchasing. We back that up with the industry's best customer service program. And, you know, there's always conversation about fees and what's happening with fees. Look, I think we can always say, because we are dedicated and committed to it, we actually take our fees and reinvest that back into value for consumers through our rewards program. One of those components is a buy 10, get one free program, which you can equate to almost 10% back to consumers if they were to continue to come to the platform, which again is us taking fees and reinvesting them to the benefit of consumers. So when you talk about some of the demand, you mentioned the strength that clearly you're seeing for concerts like Taylor Swift, also Guns N' Roses. In your case, are you seeing that strength across categories or are some outperforming others? Yeah, I, I, it, it's a great it's a great comment. You know, look, we spent time talking about concerts. Has that certainly been, I think, a really strong point in, in that history with iconic artists out there touring? But certainly it's across the board. You know, when you look at uh, the entire live event space, we're seeing uh, strength in sports. You know, we've talked about uh, an amazing, uh, you know, emergence of MLS with Messi coming to the United States this year. We've seen women's sports, you know, the uh, women's NCAA final ship with Caitlin Clark, just amazing trajectory there. And you look at the comedy scene with um, many comedians on tour. So I, I think you're really seeing live events um, and a lot of strength there because consumers, whether it's concerts, you know, sporting events, comedy, theater, you're just seeing it across the spectrum. Stan, hard not to acknowledge the, the stock price that we've continued to track as well. I mean, the company went public via SPAC. We, we know that there's been a, a falling out of favor uh, among equity markets with some of the SPACs that went public over 2021, which was the hot year for it. But what do you believe that Vivid Seats messages to investors out there that have perhaps kind of worn off a, a little bit here on the companies that went public via SPAC or even just the model um, that we've seen from Vivid Seats? Yeah. 
you know, I, I look at look the SPAC is just a vehicle for with which a vehicle to come to the you know public markets. And so I I look at us and say, yes, that was two years ago. Since then, we've posted eight record quarters across the board. And when you look at the fundamental financials of our business, you know, we are um, guiding you know this year to closer to four billion. We've raised our EBITDA guidance almost over 20% since the start of the year. Now with you know our midpoint closer to 140 in EBITDA. And if you look at the cash flow generation of our business, um, you know we're converting so much cash that look, we just announced a great acquisition. We're really excited about, again, the catalyst that that will be for many other things as we now um, lead in the entertainment capital of the US with Vegas.com. So I look at the fundamentals of our business. You know We've delivered eight quarters of a record performance. We continue to drive both growth and profitability and cash flow. And so, you know, I I ignore really the vehicle at this point. I think we've got two years of proven trajectory. And I would tell investors, look, focus on the fundamentals. And I think we are a a great business with um, a really attractive valuation uh, today. All right. Stan Chia, who is the Vivid Seats CEO. Stan, appreciate the time as always. And thanks for hopping on with us. Of course. Thanks for having me. All your markets action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Good morning. This is Yahoo Finance. Big news. Three things that you need to know. We just got the announcement. What happens now? I got a question. What does success look like? What was one of the biggest challenges that you faced? How much does that raise the odds for a recession? This phase is over. Tell me what happens to the debt ceiling. Where does generative AI, though, fit into your portfolio? Talk to us about this diversification and what investors need to know. And I think it's important. This is the stuff that gets me out of bed, fired up. What's the gateway? What's the new bridge to opportunity? Doesn't matter if it's a soft landing or a hard landing. Landing. Big, big interview. I, I can't wait. Supreme Court out with the ruling on President Biden's student debt cancellation. Right, let's turn now to some recent tech earnings. And they give you information if you watch them closely. President Vosick, President Investor Gary Gensler, thank you so much. Part of what Davos is about is sharing best practices, coming forward with ideas, and then enabling those ideas into action. And I would add that there is more to come on this. And we keep producing products that help people lead healthier lives. This is one of those rooms they use to simulate light and space. Interest rates will come down again. Figure out where your money is going now. You gotta scope that out. And the numbers really tell the story. What does all this mean for you? Keep it tuned into Yahoo Finance.
H&R Block celebrating a solid start to its fiscal year. The company beat expectations across revenue and earnings per share in its latest quarter and reaffirmed existing guidance for the full year ahead. It managed to lower losses even in the face of economic headwinds. H&R Block noted it feels well positioned in the higher rate environments. The stock up almost 14 percent since the start of the year. Well, year to date up by about 11 percent at this point. Anyway, recovering from steady declines earlier this spring. Joining us now, we've got H&R Block CEO Jeff Jones here. Jeff, you got to break down for us what's some of the win behind the sales for, or, yeah, win behind the sales for the <laughs> company over the course of this year. <laughs> Good morning, Brad. How are you? So I guess I'd break it down into into two different things. On the business front, you know, we continue to see growth across our businesses in H&R Block, in Block Advisors, in Wave, and in Spruce. And so that's really the catalyst for us driving top line growth. And, you know, we offer tremendous value for the consumer. You know, I heard your prior guests talking about the need for value with today's consumer. And they know that's true at H&R Block. They get great expertise, they pay a fair price, and they have total transparency for how the process is going to work and what they're going to pay. So we do feel very good going into this fiscal year and tax season. We think we're very well positioned. Jeff, going off the fact that you think that you're well positioned, we're still in this higher rate environment, inflationary environment. How are you adjusting your spending, your costs in order to best position H&R Block? Yeah, Sean, I mean, it really starts with just the mindset of efficiency in the company, whether it's this year or next year or the year after, really trying to maximize the value of every dollar we invest in the business. That is what the team has been doing incredibly well. We see inflation like every organization sees inflation, but maybe unlike other businesses with large retail footprints, our tax professionals uh, are not paid hourly. So as our business grows, we pay them more. It's variable with the growth of the business. So that's a bit of a uniqueness that people oftentimes forget given how many frontline employees we actually have. When you think about the customers that are, are continuing to come to the business, looking for just any type of tax advice that they could get or a, adjustment help, but where are you seeing small businesses also looking for, for that assistance right now? It's really a common theme for consumers and small businesses, Brad. I mean, if you're if you're a hardworking American and every dollar matters and you know you're getting a refund, but you want confidence that you're getting the best outcome, well, that's also true if you're a small business owner. One of the things we see small business owners trying to do is wear all of these hats as opposed to let the experts do what we do best and allow them to focus on running their business. But the dynamics remain the same. They're looking for the best outcome possible and the best advice possible. And that's where we feel very well positioned uh, with our Block Advisors brand. Jeff, going into tax season, just a few months away at this point, it's kind of hard to believe, but how does your strategy going into next year, going into April, how does that compare to what you saw or what you were doing a year ago? Well, we are expecting this to be um, a normal tax season, and we have not had a normal tax season now for many years. From the pandemic and tax filing deadlines moving, this year as we sit here today, our preparation is generally the same, but our expectation, there's no major legislative changes. We think all the stimulus filers are behind us. And so we're really well prepared for what we hope to be a normal tax season. And that's our expectation. Have, have you seen any surge in your business driven by an IRS crackdown that we've, that we've also seen as, as the agency has started to reemploy more, has started to, and I tend to keep the IRS's name out of my mouth, but in this instance, uh -huh. I gotta ask if there's been any overflow into your business as some of these crackdowns have moved forward. You know, we serve a different consumer, Brad. You know, in general, we serve hardworking Americans, middle America. Um, the vast majority of them are getting a refund. And it's really not the focus of the enforcement efforts for the IRS. So I think people are always afraid of the IRS or getting something wrong. And that's why they turn to us for expertise to get the outcome right 
but also know that we will stand behind them just in case the IRS does decide to, to take a look at their return. All right, Jeff Jones, we have to leave it there. H&R Block CEO, always appreciate you taking the time. Thanks so much for joining us here this morning. Great to see you both. Thank you. Let's do a quick check of the markets here before we let you go. Just about an hour and a half into the trading day, we're still looking at a mixed picture. You have the Dow just above the flat line. The Nasdaq, though, back in negative territory, off just about a tenth of a percent. The S&P also holding a fraction above the flat line here. Taking a look at the sector action that we're seeing, communication services, utilities, the underperformers so far today, industrials, materials real estate among the outperformers in today's action. All right, that does it for Brad and I today, but keep right here on Yahoo Finance. Priscilla Kufo, Jared Lickery have you for the next hour. We'll see you tomorrow.
Welcome to Yahoo Finance Live. It's 11 a.m. on the East Coast, 8 a.m. on the West. I'm Rochelle Akufo alongside our very own Jab Blickery here at the New York Stock Exchange. So here's a look at what we're watching this morning. Streaming slowdown. Warner Brothers Discovery reported a decrease in subscribers from the previous quarter and falling ad revenue as its CEO warns of a, quote, generational disruption amid the ongoing actor strike. And WeWork fallout, WeWork's bankruptcy filing may also be unveiling cracks in a different market, real estate, what this new wave of vacancies means for the sector. Plus, Cisco is betting big on cybersecurity. Stay tuned for our executive editor, Brian Sozzi's conversation with Cisco CEO Chuck Robbins coming up this hour. You won't want to miss it. But first, let's take a look at the market action an hour and a half into the trading day. We're seeing some some selling off action here at the moment. We're seeing the Dow off ever so slightly, though, but still at session lows at the moment, down about four points on the day. Taking a look at the S&P 500, also debt to the downside, but relatively flat. Looking at the tech heavy Nasdaq, also seeing some losses uh, so far this morning. I think uh, investors were hoping to hear a bit more from Powell this morning. Didn't really hear much. Nasdaq down about 0.2 percent. Let's also check in on what we're seeing with Treasuries as well. The shortest term five yield, the only one in the green, relatively flat. Looking at the 10 year though, still retreating from that five mark that we saw last month, currently at 4.55, down about 0.4% on the day. Also looking at the longest 30 year yield, that's down about 0.9% on the day. All right, Fed Chair Jay Powell, he made opening remarks at the 100th anniversary of the Fed's Board of uh, Division and Research and Statistics. Now, he didn't comment on the outlook for monetary policy or the economy in his remarks, but he did laud Fed forecasters for giving their economic outlook, saying they, quote, do this work on the biggest stage and with the highest stakes, knowing that the economy very often surprises us. Now, the Federal Reserve has gotten mixed reviews on their approach to fighting inflation over the last couple of years. At yesterday, Yesterday's Invest Conference, our very own Brian Sazi sat down with AT&T CEO John Stanky, who had this to say about the Fed. I think I understand what the Fed has done. I wouldn't advocate for anything else what they've done because inflation is far more insidious than dealing with the results of, of high rates right now. Well, you know, I listen to these remarks and I think about the Fed. Um, the, the, Jerome Powell, in a very big picture sense, is kind of boxed in here, mm. having to do things that a Fed chair hasn't been uh, required to do in about 40 years. Now, at the Fed conference last Wednesday, when we got that FOMC decision, I think he made it pretty clear that he wants the Fed to be uh, done with its rate hiking, but he has to allow for uh, possibilities. The street believes that Powell is going to, and Powell and co are probably going to leave rates here, and everybody's looking looking ahead to when they're going to be uh, discounting rates, potentially cutting rates as soon as next year. But uh, for all the talk of soft landing, it's important to note that we've only had a couple soft landings in history. Most of the time, we get hard landings. It's true. I mean, and people have been talking about this sort of very well long uh, telegraphed uh, recession fears yeah. here. The Fed has been very consistent in its messaging. If anything, what we heard from the last Fed meeting was that there'll be a bit more careful, a bit more conscientious, slowing down, waiting for some of these lag effects, for, for some of that medicine to really start showing up in the economy. But I, the Fed has been holding the line. And I think people who are hoping to hear a bit more from Powell today, perhaps a little bit disappointed, but he's been he's been steady in his, in, in his uh, projections. Yeah. And I, I think important, too, that the average investor and well, Powell himself, he's looking at what happened in yields. We had that explosion to 5 percent in the 10 year. Uh, he's looking at that and say, well, that's doing some of the Fed's heavy list, lifting for us. Uh, but if that doesn't happen, if he has to raise rates again, that's going to take everybody by surprise. And I think that's the thing to watch out for, because most people are not. It's true. They've still got those eyes waiting for him to, to cut those rates. Yes. Hold, hold that thought, at least for now. Well, we want to turn to Warner Brothers Discovery. It isn't having a very good day. Taking a look, the stock currently off at the moment. Now, this is after reporting its third quarter results before the bell that missed analyst expectations. You see the, st the stock there down almost 17%. Now, the company also saw weaker streaming subscribers in the quarter and delivered some downbeat guidance for the coming year, saying it expects the impact of strikes and a weak advertising market to linger into 2024. Well, let's bring in benchmark analyst Matthew Harrigan for more on this. So thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, you had shared your projections earlier. You'd lowered your price target from $26 to $24, but maintained a strong buy rating here. Do you still hold that position now based on what you've seen now from this earnings call? 
You know, absolutely. I think the aggregate numbers were satisfactory. Your EBITDA was up 22%. You did have a little bit of nominal revenue growth. I mean, you pointed out, you know, the highlights that upset the market. You know, very slight decline, you know, 700,000 in uh, streaming customers. Now, some of that was just the transition from Discovery Plus for some subscribers to, to Max. I think they feel, and also they had a, did not have much in the way of a, of a release slate on, on new content. But you do have some very nice originals coming this quarter and certainly for 2024 and 2025. You know, I think the biggest bug there was the advertising market. Frankly, you were down 13% in the last quarter. You probably had some improvement in Q4, but the, you know, there's little doubt that the uncertainty on advertising is going to persist into next year. And I think what really spooked the market was uh, the, the CFO who's done a great job in reducing costs and getting to a, you know already a four billion run rate, you know five billion identifiable, and that's obviously you know pretty locked in. I mean those those are costs rather than growth ambitions. You know suggests that they might not get to you know below three times EBITDA debt to EBITDA at the end of next year. So that of course called in the EBITDA uh, projection, and he's not giving guidance for 2024 yet. But there's definitely some discomfort that you wouldn't have much, if at all, EBITDA growth uh, next year. The you know, market's deeply skeptical on this name. It's still a show me. I think they've made tremendous progress in reducing uh, leverage and costs. But you know, nonetheless, uh, the attrition on the on the streaming you know, customers and, and the concern in the ad market is worrisome. You know, a positive is it does look like we're getting close to a resolution on the actors' uh, strike. There's about a 400,000 uh, 400 million uh, improvement in free cash flow if we're not having very much production uh, in the latter part mm. of this year. That probably reverses to some extent next year. But, you know, hopefully uh, these strikes will soon be, soon be behind us and that will be good for everyone. Well, Matthew, let me ask you in the bigger picture sense, looking at the interest rate situation, um, I, I was saying one of your colleagues over at Wells Fargo was talking about the need to see whether the, the, uh, the trends that we're seeing can offset omnipresent network pressures. Let me just talk about deleveraging here. Uh, within the interest rate environment, how are they with cash flow, cash flow and then projecting going a few quarters, maybe a year in the future? Uh, if interest rates hold high like this, where are they looking in terms of any potential cliffs? Well, I think that's really a non-issue at, at, at this point. You know, frankly, I mean, you had 2.1 billion in free cash flow this quarter. Uh, you're going to have over 5 billion, you know, this year. You know, probably some improvement next year, although you'll you'll have the effects on the on the production in reversing. You know, almost all the debt is, is fixed rate, so that also you know shouldn't be an, an issue. So the capital structure is is really you know quite manageable at this point. I mean, the issue is you know addressing the, the cyclical concerns on advertising, and then just the persistent pressures on on linear TV. On, on, but you know, I think the right way to to view the TV market is in aggregate between streaming and linear. Uh, that's certainly the way consumers view it, is even as they gear their consumption more towards streaming, uh, apart from sports and to some extent, you know, news. And uh, you know, there's a big linear TV component at, at Warner Brothers. I mean, they have Discovery. They have to manage that. Uh, you maintain the tail value as best as they can. You know, including doing some licensing, uh, you know, to other people uh, other than uh, other than using all their content, you know, for Max. You know the capital structure should not be under strain at this point, and I think that was one of the, the larger concerns when this uh, when this came out of the block, company came out of the box uh, last, last year. And Matthew, I want to talk about consolidation in the industry. It's something that Kevin Meyer, the Candle Media co-founder and co-CEO, spoke about at Yahoo Finance Invest. I want to have you take a listen, and we'll and we'll talk afterwards. You can see consolidation among these big media companies happening. You can see uh, Warner Brothers combining with a NBC Universal or, or with a Paramount. There are some combinations to be had there. Stars is still still sitting out there, you know, owned by Lionsgate. That needs to be consolidated with someone. Maybe a big digital player will buy a, a, a really a, a Hollywood player. And so in terms of consolidation in the space that you see ahead, and especially when you think of whether or not um, Warner Brothers is undervalued, what are the potential options you think from here? Well, you know, if I had to pick a deal, I would I would probably say, uh, you know, Warner Brothers, uh, you know, Paramount, you know, Global. Uh, you would have some residual antitrust concerns in, in Washington. I think you know, combinations involving 
uh, in multiple broadcast you know, networks. Uh, you know, certainly, you know, Paramount and uh, NBC Universal would come under that. You know, rubric. You know, also combining large studios. You know, I think that you know, Stars and Lionsgate to some extent are are free radicals, as as Liberty Chairman John Malone would describe them. So I do think that they probably fall off the map at some point. But I mean, there's been a lot of consolidation already. Yeah, you know, I, I think to some extent you know, these companies really need to show that they have you know, viable businesses. I mean, you do get more, and on the broadcast side, you do get more critical mass, but uh, I, I think a lot of the focus of these companies is really on an organic improvement rather than doing further M&A right now, apart from the smaller guys who are still uh, still dangling out there. All right, well, I appreciate you taking you know, certainly the time to when join you us this morning. Record, you know, Disney and Fox, you know, the results on that has not exactly been inspiring. So I think people are very guarded on doing large deals, and they certainly don't want to overpay. It's true. It's something we'll be continuing to keep an eye on. A thank you there to benchmark analyst Matthew thank Harrigan. Thank you for joining us this morning. All right, taking a look at our trending ticker, no toast for toast last night. The stock dropped after reporting third quarter earnings after the bell and is extending those losses in today's session. The restaurant payments tech company narrowed its revenue guidance for the next quarter. This move reflects the dip it saw in gross payment volume per location in September and says the trend continued into October as well. Now, following the report, Mitsuho analysts cut their price target on Toast stock to $14 from $16. The firm already downgraded the stock to neutral in early October. Feeling more positive, William Blair analysts say growth remains very strong and the company is navigating macro headwinds relatively well. Yeah. Would you say so, Jared? Well, I, I'll take you mentioned Mizuho. Let me just uh, add a comment by them. You said they lowered their price target from $16 to $14. Uh, they're saying revenue in the quarter was OK, but gross payment volume, that's a key metric, somewhat disappointing. And then I'll add to that the Wells Fargo commentary. They rate the stock in underweight, price target 15 to 16. Uh, tailwinds appear to be flipping to headwinds. And they see potential fundamental concerns raised in these results, which is going to draw greater scrutiny on 2024. Uh, in general, um, let's go to the Wi-Fi in Interactive. I just want to chart this really quickly because from the IPO, from that listing date that we have in late last, uh, or actually 2021, it is now down 75%, got destroyed last year, like a lot of IPOs that it came to market uh, ahead of the Federal Reserve raise, raising interest rate just got slaughtered. And that's something that we're hearing though. So uh, kind, of a, kind of a bad, I would say, sometimes you're just caught up uh, with some bad timing in the market, Rochelle. It's true. It certainly seems to be the case for Toast. Under a lot of pressure at the moment, we'll be keeping a track of that for you. All right. All your action in the markets is going to be ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Good news if you're looking to buy a home. Mortgage rates are plunging last week, but by the most in over a year. The 7.61% rate is the largest drop since July of 20 uh, to 2022, but it is enough, is it enough, for people to afford their homes? We spoke to Oracle of Wall Street, Meredith Whitney, this week, and uh, here's what she had to say. I have never been one to say that we would go into a recession in 2023, and I don't think we're going to go into a recession in 2024, and here's why. Um, I divide the economy into two sectors. Um, those uh, under 38 years old, I call them the avocado toast generation. So that's Gen Z and the lower uh, cohort of um, the millennials. Um, they have jobs, they're employed. But and so they have money, they have income, but they don't have wealth. They don't own homes. And then you have 38 and above, which are the homeowners. Well, now let's talk commercial real estate. WeWork owes landlords all over the country millions of dollars in leases and termination fees. In just New York, they owe about $49 million. More on the impact of the company's bankruptcy on landlords. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance reporter Danny Romero for more of this. So more troubles for WeWork already. Michelle, the shoe has dropped in the commercial real estate sector. Now with WeWork's bankruptcy filing this week, it really gives us a glimpse at how rising rates has really, and the stalled return to work environment has really added turbulence to the office space sector. WeWork has over 600 locations worldwide. And WeWork CEO David Tolley said in court that the company's real estate advisor is renegotiating office leases with over 400 landlords. And this process started back in 2022. We work re renegotiated some of its le leases, but that did little to ease the cash crunch. Remember, lease payments consume 75% of WeWork's revenue in the second quarter of this of this year. The big picture here is the loss of WeWork really will increase uh, vacancies. It might even lower rent for tenants, but that means less cash for landlords to pay their debt payments in this high interest rate environment. A worst case scenario would also be that it may even prompt landlords to uh, default on some of their loans and mortgages and would also affect that would affect the banking system more broadly and also local and city tax revenues. Uh, just to draw attention to the elephant in the room here, there's some applause on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. A number of uniformed officers uh, were proceeding down there, but it seems to have subsided now. But Danny, I want to ask you about what cities are really most effective here. I look in, uh, I walk around New York, I still see WeWork signs in front of buildings, and some of them really don't have that much activity in them. Offices in San Francisco, New York, and Boston are likely going to be impacted with WeWork's bankruptcy. That's what experts say. CoStar said that around 42% of WeWork's occupancies are actually in those cities. And so WeWork has already uh, has plans, excuse me, to close about 35% of its footprints in those markets. Now in New York City, like you pointed out, Jared, WeWork had, uh, has a lot of class B buildings. They have a lot of exposure. And so WeWork's rent in those buildings were actually a lot higher than the other tenants in those buildings. So landlords won't be able to really easily recoup some of that money. But it's really important to highlight that WeWork's bankruptcy will impact local governments, especially when it comes to their budgets. A lot of local cities rely on commercial property tax revenue. And so that will really hinder some of the, the budget side. And for example, in New York City, 21% of the tax revenue, excuse me, office properties make up 21% of the tax revenue. All right. Thank you for that. Yahoo Finance reporter, Danny Romero. In a tough year for consumer goods, solo brands reporting solid quarter, uh, third quarter earnings. The company is reporting increases in net sales and net income, and that is compared to last year. So for more on this, solo brand CEO John Maris is here. And John, we just want to ask you, uh, big picture, thank you for joining us here today. Uh, what's going on? Uh, what's your latest message, I guess, for the consumer here? We've seen a lot of success in the direct-to-consumer business. Um, how are things for you? Yeah, you know, listen, the consumer, I mean, you guys are seeing it, you're talking about it a lot. The consumer is still pressured for sure. Uh, it's a different environment out there right now. 
But brands that are innovating, we've been saying this for a while, brands that are innovating, listening to the customer and meeting their needs are brands that consumers are still choosing to, to shop with and to, to participate with. Solo Brands has been on the receiving end of that. We've had a lot of innovation and been excited about what we've been able to drive even in this tough environment. So John, talk about this omni-channel approach, because when you, when you look at direct-to-consumer revenue, it did fall 11.6% um, versus the same quarter last year, but wholesale revenue, that's up 114% versus Q3 of last year. Talk about the strategies that you're using there as you continue to expand in digitally connected commerce. Yeah, we said at the beginning of this year that we wanted to start exploring ways that we could leverage retail partnerships to help us drive more traffic and exposure to our brands. We have executed on that strategy and seen tremendous success in a, in a tough year in retail. Uh, we're seeing tremendous growth. We expected some cannibalization of our direct to consumer business, our e-commerce business, and we have seen that, but not in excess of what we expected, actually potentially slightly less. And so overall, we're very happy with these partnerships, Dick Sporting Goods, Ace Hardware, uh, Costco have all been great partners to us this year amongst many others. And that has offset some of that, that headwind I think one of the highlights I'll call out to our Q3 results is while we delivered 8% growth year over year, we, we delivered 33% EBITDA growth year over year. So we are seeing better profitability as we've made this transition to more balance between our direct to consumer and our retail business. And you mentioned some companies there. I know you've continued to invest in brand awareness, retail partnerships, most recently Target. Talk about that decision because some of your other partnerships, when you think Dick Sporting Goods, REI, Public Land Shields, these are all for your, your outdoorsy, sporty person. Whereas Target, it's a much broader consumer base there. So why Target? What's the appeal there? Yeah, we've been working really hard for the last year at innovating around ways to, to get our products to be more accessible to everyday consumers and, and also different demographics. Um, we're really excited about the Target partnership. Our Mesa tabletop fire pit is super easy to use. It allows you to do a very kind of non-invasive s'more type experience. You only need 25, 30 minutes. You can even do it on a school night. Uh, but that tabletop unit is easy for anybody to use. You can start a fire, we say box to burn in five minutes and then be making s'mores with the kids or with friends and family uh, on your tabletop. So that's the product that's going into Target. We think that it opens up a completely new demographic to us and we're excited to see how that does uh, this holiday season. Well, let's talk about the holiday season, your plans, um, any, any products you can talk about? Uh, some of your, I guess, offerings are seasonally related. So what do we have in store for the holidays? Yeah, we have some new product launches that we uh, did not have last year. We actually just this morning, I can, I can share, just released a new metallic series, a new colorway of fire pits that we have not had. So now consumers can enjoy different colored units uh, on their back patio or something on the go. We have a few more in the till we have not released yet. We also have some fun marketing initiatives coming out over this next week. You may have heard or seen our press release, but we have actually a Macy's Day uh, float this year for the first time. So we are expanding our horizon, becoming a more family friendly, uh, more approachable brand. And, and we're excited to see how these things play out over these next few weeks. So hopefully I'm going to see you cooking some s'mores out there alongside the, the Macy's Day float. I have, I have high expectations now. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us this morning. <laughs> John Merris, Solo Brand CEO, thank you so much. All right, all your markets action still ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Welcome back. Artificial intelligence is changing the game in the world of cybersecurity. Cisco this week introduced a new lineup of security suites for the modern era at its annual partner summit. Less than two months after announcing it would be acquiring tech firm Splunk in a major $28 billion agreement. The latest deal amplifying Cisco's investment in AI and digital security. I'm here with Cisco chairman and CEO Chuck Robbins. Chuck, always nice to get some time with you here. I know Big event down there, uh, I believe, in, in Miami. What exactly did you announce, and why is it so important to investors? Well, first of all, Brian, it's great to see you, and thanks for having me on. Uh, we had a we've had a great few days with our partners. You know, we have been a partner-led company for a very long time, and this week we made uh, well, last week actually we made a lot of announcements around AI in our WebEx and our collaboration portfolio. This. This week, we talked about a lot of AI announcements in, in our security portfolio. We announced new security suites that you just pointed out around user, cloud, and breach. Uh, this follows on a lot of announcements earlier this year around an extended detection and response platform that has got great momentum as, uh, as we've rolled it out, uh, as well as uh, multi-cloud defense. And, uh, and then you reference a Splunk acquisition, which we think will be a big play for us in security. So it's been a, uh, it's been a good few months. It's been a busy few months, uh, Chuck, that much is for sure. Uh, I think you put out a study ahead of this or in relation to this, uh, these new announcements. 70% of companies aren't prepared, prepared for the AI revolution. Uh, that has to worry, you know? Well, it's, it's an opportunity to help, uh, honestly. It's, uh, we, we did a, an AI readiness survey. We've done this with cybersecurity for years, and we replicated it around AI. And I think that uh, what it just shows is what you would probably expect at this point. Customers are digesting all the new AI capabilities and the tools. Uh, they're trying to build their strategy right now. We happen to be in the technology industry, so we've been using predictive AI for a very long time, so the move to generative AI wasn't as big a jump. But I think that customers uh, will be looking at how they use uh, AI internally to make themselves more efficient, how they use AI to engage with their customers more effectively. It'll represent an infrastructure opportunity for us as well as just guiding them. And, and it introduces a lot of security uh, needs and uh, things that they'll need to be thinking about on that front as well. I know, Chuck, uh, Cisco has been, and under your leadership, really focused on uh, driving recurring revenue. Do these AI products facilitate that? Do they improve your margins? And are they all uh, pretty much fee-based? Well, most, it, it depends. Some of, our, some of our technology are simply like new capabilities within the security portfolio or new capabilities within WebEx. So if you have an AI assistant in our collaboration portfolio that is, is going to give you a natural language uh, interface to check on 
what occurred in a meeting that you were 10 minutes late for. I mean, those are just incremental features that increase the value of the platform. In other cases, we sell a lot of infrastructure uh, that will help our customers build out their own AI, AI capabilities. In many cases, there'll be subscriptions associated with that. So it's going to vary across the portfolio. Speaking of, uh, I guess, just uh, efficiencies, Chuck, recently Splunk said it was becoming more efficient, had some headcount reductions there. Was that planned? And, and are you now getting a more efficient operation when this deal ultimately closes? Yeah, this is a, you know, Gary Steele has just done an amazing job with Splunk since he took over as CEO. And the, all of the changes that you've seen were things that he had planned. Uh, and uh, those were decisions that he had made. And I think obviously uh, we ha they, where they are today versus where they were two years ago, I think is completely different. And he continues to just do the things that he felt like he needed to do to run the company. And, and I support him 100%. Are you still on track with the uh, closing date? Well, obviously, we have to get through the approval cycle, which uh, we're, you know, we're working with them in any way we can. And uh, we've said next summer to, you know, nine to 12 months is what we said when we did the announcement. And uh, we don't ha we haven't heard anything that would lead us to a different uh, uh, belief at this point, Brian. Fair enough. Uh, we're just coming off, Chuck, our big uh, Yahoo Finance Invest conference. Talked to a lot of great leaders such as yourself. Um, there was a little bit of caution in the air as we round into next year. Some folks said the consumer is doing well, others are starting to see a pullback. From your vantage point, what are you seeing? Well, we're in our blackout period right now, so I will uh, probably won't give a whole lot of color around it, except to say that there are a lot of dynamics in the world, obviously. Uh, there are, uh, uh, we've got the interest rate pressure, you've got uh, this, this emerging assessment of what's happening with the consumer, we've got geopolitical dynamics that have existed for a while. We obviously have uh, you know, war in the Middle East, war in Europe. And so there's a lot of unknowns and I think uh, we're just gonna have to see how the next few months play out. Have you, what's your, in these times where there's a lot of focus on geopolitical tensions in the US and of course overseas, what has been your message yeah. to employees and, and has it changed how you lead the company? Well, I don't think that's new. We've had a, a, a lot of issues going on around the world and in society for the last seven or eight years that our employees have expected us to address with them. Uh, you know, we take, uh, we take positions on those things that are important to our company or are just, uh, you know, incredibly moral lines that we don't believe should be crossed. Uh, in many cases, some of the issues are uh, are very political, are very emotional. And so we try to support our employees on all sides of those issues. And so we've been doing this for a while and we, we continue to engage and talk to our employees about the things that they want to talk about. All right, well, uh, leave it there. Always great to get some time with you. Hope to continue this conversation. And Davos is going to be in a few weeks, Chuck. We'll bring out those uh, really, really heavy Parkers. Chuck Robbins, Chairman and CEO of Cisco. <laughs> Look you. forward to seeing you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. All right, all your markets action, uh, stay ahead, uh, straight ahead from the New York Stock Exchange. Really cool to be up here. This is my first time after all these years on top of the New York Stock Exchange. Good stuff. Jared and Rochelle, right back at you.
A new report on household debt from the Federal Reserve Bank of New York is now saying that Americans collectively owe over $1 trillion on their credit cards, with balances spiking by $154 billion year over year. Now, it's the largest increase since 1999. The biggest culprit of the debt? The Federal Reserve's string of 11 rate hikes to combat inflation, including four hikes that occurred in 2023. And this has a compounding impact on credit card rates, which are now more than 20%, reaching an all-time high. And additionally, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York also saying that credit card delinquencies have risen across the board, particularly among millennials, those between the ages of 30 and 39, who are burdened by student loan debt, as if they didn't have enough to deal with, Jared. Yeah, yeah I'm looking at that chart right there. It is delinquencies. We hear about them, but that has barely budged, at least from looking at mortgage rates. And also, we're seeing a little bit of a tick up in student loans, a little bit of an inflection in credit cards. But for the most part, you look at 2008 on that chart, that was way up there. So a long ways from those levels that we've seen. All right, got to shift gears. The SEC taking aim at structural issues that were exposed during the meme stock mania of early 2021 by trying to have the settlement time of most security uh, securities trades. That would be to one day instead of two days, or so-called T plus one now. Yet the change may cause more headaches and drive up costs, especially for $1 trillion of ETFs. And this is according to Bloomberg, because while the transactions for the shares of the ETF may settle in one day, it can still take two to five days for the transactions to complete for all of the underlying assets if they're overseas and subject to different regulatory requirements. So how should investors be thinking about the ETF space? As part of the ETF report brought to you by Invesco QQQ, let's bring in now BlackRock Global Head of Bond ETF, Stephen Lapley, to discuss more. Steve, glad to see you here. Um, just kind of break this down to us. There's a lot of wonky stuff, but I, I guess my view is a few years ago before GameStop, we had already converted to two days from three days settlement, and now we're going to one. Uh, is the, world, the rest of the world going to catch up, or is this going to be some kind of issue for ETFs as we've been talking about? Hi, Jared. Uh, thanks for having me. I don't have a specific comment on this. It is something that we are keeping an eye on. Um, overall, we think long term um, this will be uh, healthy for, for the ecosystem, but, but we're, we're just watching right now. And of course, we've got to talk bond ETFs, especially given the market, the action that we've seen in the market and some of the retreats that we've seen as well. When you look at some of the best performing bond ETFs, where can investors still get in? Where do you still see some upside to go? Well, what's really interesting, if you look at the, the pattern of flows this year, it's, it's a little bit counterintuitive because you've seen the bulk of flows go into uh, Treasury securities in the U.S. So with, with our iShares franchise, we've seen uh, about 50 billion come into treasuries, despite the fact that yields have been rising. Overall, we've taken in 64 billion. Um, ironically, one of the best performing sectors has actually been high yield, uh, which is a sector that's been in, out, in outflows most of the year. It's returned uh, roughly 7% year to date, and it's yielding around 9%. We have started to see investors come back into high yield. Um, so just uh, in the last month, I think we've seen uh, over 3 billion uh, come in uh, to, to high yield through our ETFs. So investors are starting to turn in sentiment. I think a little bit of that has to do with, with views that the Fed might be uh, coming to the end of its cycle. Um, where we're seeing flows go otherwise, um, we continue to see flows into those uh, buy right products. Um, those have uh, now crossed over a billion in flows since inception. Um, we're seeing flows um, go into active ETFs as well. So that's something um, new uh, most fixed income ETFs have been indexed where we're starting to see investors uh, turn to active ETFs such as uh, BINC, which is the one we uh, most recently launched in May. I've uh, got to ask you about crypto here. There's been a, a renewed interest in finally getting a spot Bitcoin ETF, of which BlackRock has submitted applications. Um, not gonna, I'm not asking you to comment on that one in particular, but just in general, uh, how do you see the ETF industry gearing up for this eventual uh, product that would come to mar market, which would be a spot Bitcoin ETF? I think broadly, Jared, the industry is just evaluating what uh, what things should be in an ETF, if it can be done, what the proper structure is. This is just one manifestation of that. I think, you know, we as an industry and, and BlackRock in particular, we want to innovate responsibly. Um, so this is something that we're, we're continuing to monitor um, and, and we'll just see see how we progress from here. And when you're looking ahead, it was, we're staying in a higher for longer interest rate environment. A lot of people wondering, 
aren't bond ETFs the way to go? So in terms of some of the questions that your clients have, how are they viewing this, this potential time as we are waiting for eventual rate cuts somewhere potentially in 2024, but still not on the books at the moment? Yeah, I, I, uh, we do think bond ETFs are, are the way to go. We've seen, uh, despite the past uh, two years of, of this, you know, um, incredibly historic tightening cycle. It's created some of the most challenging bond markets um, on record. We've continued to see very, very robust flows um, into bond ETFs. Um, one way that investors have uh, been able to navigate that um, has been through, um, you know, our I bonds franchise. So those are our bond ETFs that simply roll down and mature. That's that's one way investors have pivoted. Um, we've seen about seven billion go into that. However, um, to your point, Rochelle, once we um, see interest rates stabilize, or the, rather more importantly, the market believes that they have finally stabilized and the Fed has reached the end of its cycle. We, we believe that there will be significant flows um, into fixed income and bond ETFs uh, in particular as investors retool their portfolios. So obviously we can't predict the economic environment, but investors are most likely to come out of cash and start extending into duration at least somewhat. Um, as they bolster their portfolios um, for, for a potential slowdown and as inflation continues to fall. Bonds continuing to be the, the rock star story uh, so far this year. I appreciate you taking the time to join us. Thank you to BlackRock Global co-head of bond ETFs, Steve Lapley, joining us as part of the ETF report brought to you by Invesco QQQ. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, well, now to gaming. Nintendo has announced that it will be coming out with a live action movie of Legend of Zelda. Super excited. Hopefully riding on the coattails of the company's successful foray into movies with Super Mario Brothers. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Alexandra Canal to give us more details. I, I played the game as a kid. The Mario movie did fantastic. I'm, I'm excited about this, Ali. I knew you were going to be excited about this, Rochelle, and I'm excited too. Japanese game maker Nintendo developing that live action film release of Zelda. It will be financed in part by Sony, who will also distribute the film. You mentioned that this follows the ultra success of the Super Mario Brothers movie. We saw that film capture $1.4 billion at the global box office. Earlier today, we saw Nintendo shares jump as much as 6% on the heels of that news. They're up just under 5 percent right now, but this game franchise in particular has been very popular. Nintendo has said it sold nearly 20 million copies of the latest title in the series following its May launch through September, and that strength in the gaming unit actually prompted Nintendo on Tuesday to raise its profit forecast by 24 percent for the fiscal year ending in March. So it's a strategy that we're really seeing across media right now, especially if we think about some of the box office films that have done well this year. Mattel's Barbie, just another example of how you can really utilize a product or a game to drive sales. And it's likely that we're going to see this strategy be repeated by other media companies. Kevin Mayer, who is the former streaming head at Disney, he currently serves as a co-CEO of his company, Candle Media. He hinted at this during the Yahoo Finance Invest Conference on Tuesday. And during my conversation with him, he said gaming was really the last frontier for Disney to tackle. Take a listen to what he had to say. Games is the one place where I think Disney has not yet made mm. substantial investment. It's also a place where people can interact with and spend a lot of time with their favorite, favorite characters in context. So in a game context, they're, they're, in, they're in the places that you want to see them and you can interact with the characters, you can control them, and you can monetize it. So gaming is the last big um, sort of business platform. He yeah, has so really interesting comments there, especially considering we've seen Netflix really lean on games recently as well. So just another way to really keep users in the ecosystem of a company. And you never know, you could have a game be super successful that it turns into a billion dollar box office movie. We'll see if Zelda can accomplish what the Super Mario Brothers did earlier this year. Hey, you can't deny that Barbie juggernaut for sure. Thank you for that, Ali Canal. All your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Brooke Tamama, live for the New York Stock Exchange. Kava posted a beat on both the top and bottom line. Same source sales surge 14% as foot traffic remains strong in Q3, and customers added more to their meal, like premium protein options, drinks, and chips. I'm joined live for the New York Stock Exchange with Kava CEO Brett Shulman. Brett, thank you so much for joining us again. Thanks, Brooke. Thanks for having me. Of course, of course. So the stock is down. It's feeling some pressure. What do you think investors are weighing on right now? Well, we're not focused on the day-to-day -day gyrations of the stock. We're focused on building the next large-scale cultural cuisine category, Mediterranean cuisine, that unique cuisine we're tasting healthy night for the next decade and beyond. All right, so not too worried about shares being lower today? We're not focused on that. And now Wall Street is worried a bit about that slowing sales growth in Q1 of next year. Are they right to have those sort of concerns? Well, we had 7.6% traffic growth in this quarter. When you look at Q1 of next year, we're going to be lapping a 28% comp. So we had a significant comp next year, so obviously a bigger hurdle. But our long-term comp projections have not changed, nor has our long-term opportunity to create the next large-scale cultural cuisine category. Now, prices will return to a more normalized level. Do you think that you have enough pricing power to keep consumers coming back? Or do you think consumers might be a bit more choicy about how much they order? Well, we've worked very hard the last few years to mitigate the price increases that some of our peers have taken. So we only took 4% back in January. We don't have plans to take price the rest of the year. And then in 2024, we plan to get back to more historical, normalized increases of 25 to 3%. So really working on behalf of our guests to create that great value proposition so that our food can be accessible to a really wide audience. And what is the current average price for a Cava Bowl? Well, our per person average, right, that's just everyone that gets an entree, is around 1350 And will that raise next year? Uh, we talked about 25 to 3% as our more normalized price increases going forward. And, and Kava did benefit from lower food prices last quarter. You are adding steak to the menu. How do you see Kava's uh, food costs coming into 2024? Yeah, we, we see it. Uh, we talked about on the on the earnings call how we had a little bit of benefit from uh, chicken, but that we, we plan uh, low to mid single digits in COGS next year. And steak is in test uh, if it succeeds in the next stage of the stage gate test, which is a, a test pilot in our markets of Dallas and Boston. Uh, then we'll look to launch that later in 2024. You also did announce a significant increase in wages. Wages are up 8% from where they were a year ago. What is the current average hourly wage for a Kava employee at the restaurant? Yeah, so this has always been core to our DNA since day one. The Kava is a place where you can build a career, not just have employment. So we have a track record over time of investing in our team members. Even back in 2016, we took our national starting wage to $13 an hour when many folks were paying $9 or $10 an hour in a market. So we're focused on continuing to drive that investment. We view our team members as assets, not expenses, to really sustainably scale our business as we grow rapidly. Is there a, a price point, is there or rather a current wage that you see, say $18, $20, $21 an hour? We don't frame it in those terms. We just look to be a leading brand competitively in all markets we operate in. Right. In addition to that, catering does seem to be a growing business for Kava. What sort of growth opportunities do you see that and what sort of demand is there for that? Yeah, it's a tremendous growth opportunity, but we want to be mindful that it doesn't come at the expense of other channels. So how do we how do we build that production to support catering without uh, impacting our already significant average unit volumes where some restaurants, we don't have a lot of extra excess capacity to do catering. It's a different type of production model. So we've been testing a number of formats. One we call our hybrid kitchen. We have eight of those open today that have an extended back of house that allow for centralized catering production in support of some of those adjacent restaurants that may not have that added capacity. So we'll work on the test throughout next year, but we see it as a huge opportunity. Even with the uh, hubs that we have open today and the test pilot restaurants, we catered almost every Major League Baseball team this summer, including the Texas Rangers on the night before they won the World Series. <laughs> Casual. Uh, yeah, and, and even uh, teams like the LA Lakers, uh, NFL teams, let alone all the uh, office clients as well as school clients. So we see this as a great opportunity down the road, but we want to make sure we build our production architecture out to deliver a great experience once we do choose to launch nationally. 
Right, and this has been a huge year in terms of, of growth, in terms of expansion. You guys opened seven to 73 in total. That's the total you guys are expecting for 2023. Any particular location seeing the largest volume so far this year out of those new openings? I think that's the great thing that gets us so excited about our brand is that we see consistent performance across all regions of the country and across urban and suburban. So really great AUVs, very consistently. And that's what we saw in our comps as well. Whether it's uh, a, every vintage, and every uh, region of the country, we see this consistent performance that shows the proven portability and broad appeal of our Mediterranean cuisine. And any sort of headwinds up against the real estate company, I know that you guys have sort of baked in where you're able to mitigate those headwinds, but any that you're seeing right now heading into 2024? Yeah, well, we started to identify that earlier in the year with the interest rate environment and the cap rate environment, maybe starting to put a crimp on some new development plans or having uh, developers rethink the underwriting. So what we did back then was we increased our buffer from 20% to 30%. So this is the number of deals we source to get in the pipeline, knowing that there's going to be some slippage. So increasing that buffer really helped mitigate any of the impact that we're seeing in the development community so that we can not only stay on our development pipe uh, timeline and pipeline, we were actually able to increase our unit count guidance uh, for 2023. Brett Shulman, Kava CEO, thank you so much for joining you. Joining us, joining IM Finance, Rochelle Jared, back to you. All right, thank you to our very own Brooke De Palma there. Thank you so much. All right, well, let's get your final check of the markets uh, before, we, before we close out and head into the noon hour. Still looking at red across the board here. We're seeing the S&P 500, though, now set to snap an eight-day streak. Real, real estate and tech leading sector-wise, utilities, the laggard. The Dow currently near session lows as well, but still relatively flat, down about a quarter of a percent. Also looking at the Nasdaq Composite set to break a nine-day streak. Amazon, Meta, and Tesla, though, still in the red, Jared. Yeah, a little bit of a downdraft here, but considering the gains that we've had in the eight, nine days prior, just a little bit, just a little off the top here. So with that, we're going to send it off into the ether here. Thank you for watching Yahoo Finance. We'll be back.